בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We are uh, back here on our Wednesday night, Stump the Rabbi. בעזרת uh, השם, we'll uh, give some דברי תורה, and uh, then after that, uh, you guys will ask some questions. בעזרת השם, הקדוש ברוך הוא will give us the answers. Uh, tonight's שיעור will be for a uh, רפואה שלמה, for נהוראי אמת בן הדסה. And uh, also for Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Avi Mori David Ben Esriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, uh, and also for Atzlacha Raba, Atziyat Dishmaya for Marsha Bat Juli, Ayla Bat Marsha, Samuel Ben Marsha, Sephas Ben Marsha, Alexander Ben Marsha, Louis Ben Marsha, and all of Am Yisrael and all of the righteous Noahides that continue to uh, help us do everything that we possibly can. to get Am Yisrael and uh, the rest of the world that has an open ear uh, back closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Um, so we, uh, Baruch Hashem, we have a lot going on, uh, a little bit of te- uh, technical uh, difficulties, but Bezat Hashem will be able to get this thing uh, off the road. Uh, updates, uh, lots of stuff uh, has been in the works. I've been very uh, pressed with uh, different projects, so I know I told you guys I was going to update the store with some new products, but, um, you know, to, to, to give out. But uh, to be honest with you, I can barely find time to breathe. Uh, so uh, that too is coming. Um, there is, Baruch uh, Hashem, lots of, uh, you know, good things coming in. Uh, secondly, um, the, uh, the Kolal Baruch Hashem is a, uh, continuing to uh, grow, continuing to prosper, Baruch Hashem. So... Any of you that uh, are already contributing to uh, sponsor yourself an Avrech for a week or for a month or whatever it is, please continue. For those of you that want the merit to have one of the Avrechim, uh, you know, study Torah for your sake, uh, you know, please uh, make it uh, uh, one of the things that you can uh, add to your uh, monthly investments. Uh, aside from that, always remind you guys to the best place to watch the Shurim is either on our app, the Bezat Hashem app, that you can find in the uh, uh, app stores on Google and on iOS, or on bh.live. bh.live, that's the, uh, you can watch the lectures live over there. And of course, to watch them on, uh, uh, you know, after they're live on YouTube, on our channels, bhtorah.org. Uh, there's uh, lots of uh, good things over there so always a reminder for you guys to uh, download the app it's um, quite frankly it's the uh, it's much better than Facebook uh, not just because of the uh, um, la- less distractions but simply the feed Baruch Hashem uh, is uh, much more reliable Baruch Hashem and uh, you know it's a uh, Uh, the way the world is going right now and how uh, you know it seems like we're uh, slowly but surely uh, going to um, exit out of the uh, Facebook altogether at some point uh, or at least it's not going to be a significant just simply because there's enough uh, there's enough uh, better technology out there that's no longer necessary uh, aside from that the uh, uh, big holiday of Shavuot is is upon us we're uh, literally only a matter of days uh, before it and uh, I know we've discussed this in the past and, and I've had entire shiurim uh, done about uh, the uh, you know Shavuot and we just talked about it a couple of days ago about how Shavuot you know although it's a uh, the time of Matan Torah we received the Torah uh, and uh, which really was uh, something we were supposed to prepare for uh, one interesting thing is that uh, you'll notice is that the, the custom among Klal Yisrael, whether you're Sephardi or Ashkenazi, uh, it is a, uh, to read the Book of Ruth during a time of Shavuot. And uh, there are different Chachamim that discuss why the Book of Ruth. The Gaon Mivilna, uh, Alav HaShalom, writes, and it's quoted here in the uh, Yakut Yosef, that uh, because Shavuot is a time where we celebrate the receiving the reception of the Torah and uh, the beautiful part is is that before we got to Mount Sinai there was no Judaism you know there was we were considered the uh, the Hebrews the Israelites but there was no Judaism yet you know Kadosh Baruch Hu obviously created Adam Rishon Adam Rishon was a uh, Kodesh Kodashim uh, Eved Hashem 
uh, made one uh, mistake in his uh, his life. We wish we only made one mistake in our life. He had Metushelach, he had Chanoch, he had Noach, he had uh, uh, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov. All of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, holy people that uh, that are in essence our forefathers, especially Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. That in essence Judaism began with them. Uh, in fact, the Gemara uh, discusses it in, in several places, one of them being in uh, Masechet Abu Dazara, that uh, Avraham Tiken, Avraham uh, instituted the, uh, the prayer of Shachrit, uh, Yitzchak instituted the prayer of Mincha, and Yaakov uh, uh, Arvit. And uh, so we already know that the, uh, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov fulfilled the entire Torah, even though they were not obligated to do so. Uh, but they fulfilled it in a uh, in a certain fashion where uh, they uh, um, uh, didn't fulfill it a hundred percent like someone is able to do it now because again there are certain rules within the Torah that forbid a uh, Gentile from doing specific things that were only gifted to Am Yisrael. Uh, as I've told you in the past, one of the things was Shabbat, where Avraham, the way he would observe Shabbat is uh is the, the highest level but he would also violate shabbat uh, by creating a cow each shabbat you're not allowed to create so he would uh, use the uh, sefer yetzira and uh and literally create a cow uh, and this is actually what he fed those angels uh when they uh, came to him or were in essence three arabs uh, in his eyes he didn't know they were angels and he fed them uh milk and meat so people ask, how could he feed them milk and meat and still observe the entire Torah? Simple. It wasn't considered meat. It was a created cow. If you can create a cow, you could also eat it with cheese. Uh, so Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, in essence, were our, our forefathers. They're Kodesh Kodeshim on the, uh, uh, the, the level of uh, holiness that uh, Yaakov Avinu had is beyond human comprehension, so much so that HaKadosh Baruch Hu took his image took the image of Yaakov Avinu and he put it on his Kisea Kavod, on his uh, holy throne. Uh, the, the, the level of holiness of Yaakov Avinu is above and beyond any human comprehension. But yet the, uh, the whole uh, uh, Judaism in general uh, was, uh, was officially uh, um, instituted into the world at Mount Sinai, which means that before Mount Sinai there was no Judaism, we were Israelites, we were Hebrews, uh, but after Mount Sinai, we all had to go through a, uh, an actual conversion. We had to go through an actual conversion, and the Gaomi Vilna says that this is the reason why, you know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu told uh, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu to tell Am Yisrael to go purify ourselves, dip in the mikveh, stay away from our wives for a few days, uh, to bring a uh, sacrifice and this is, in essence, all part of Matan Torah. And uh, the Gemara actually also says this is the reason why, originally, it was supposed to be, uh, converts of the old generation uh, would uh, actually have to have enough money reserved or a living cow that they actually kept uh, in preparation for the time of Mashiach. Because when the Mashiach comes, they would actually have to bring this uh, cow as a sacrifice. But Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai saw that uh, people were having a tough time affording this, and he uh, issued a takana that there was no longer an obligation for them to maintain it at all times, uh, whether it be the money or the cow itself. Nonetheless, the, uh, the Gaomi Vilna says that the reason why we read the book of Ruth on Shavuot is because just like uh, Ruth was a convert that from her, HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought David HaMelech, Shlomo HaMelech, and eventually the Mashiach Tzidkenu. Uh, in essence, a convert sanctified herself while her sister desecrated herself, despite her conversion. This convert Ruth brought David HaMelech, which eventually will uh, bring Mashiach. Her sister Orpa uh, ended up bringing Goliath, the, the enemy of Am Yisrael. So you see how somebody with a single action, a single decision, could either uh, sanctify themselves while the, another person uh, could uh, destroy themselves just with a small decision, sticking with the Torah or going against the Torah. But nonetheless, until this day, we celebrate that this holy woman, this tzaddikah, Ruth, converted to Judaism, and from her, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is bringing the Mashiach, 
and uh, we read it because we are celebrating the Torah where all of Am Yisrael converted to Judaism. This was also the uh, uh, the argument uh, against uh, Zimri, uh, who was uh, uh, a uh, an old timer, an old man that was uh, one of the few that lived to see uh, Yaakov Avinu. Uh, he was one of the grandsons of Yaakov Avinu, who was hundreds of years old. But then, uh, when he heard that uh, Moshe Rabenu was issuing death penalties to people that were violating the Torah, and some of those people were part of his tribe, uh, Zimri got upset that he did that Moshe Rabenu, uh, although the leader, still he did not give him the respect of uh, asking him what he thought about these death penalties of killing people in his own tribe, and that's why Zimri, uh, in essence, took re- tried taking revenge against Moshe Rabenu by uh, going with uh, Cosby, the the Midianite, and uh, embarrassing Moshe Rabenu in front of everyone by uh, taking this Goya this non-Jewish woman, uh, and uh, saying to, uh, to Moshe Rabbeinu, what, uh, who, you know, what you're saying that I'm not allowed to be with her? I'll uh, convert her. You know, who says that uh, you converted your wife? This, uh, this foolishness came obviously because of his anger, and the Gemara says that anyone that uh, is angry forgets his wisdom. Had he actually remembered what happened not long before that, during the time of Matan Torah, you would have known that everybody converted. Everybody that was at Mount Sinai converted to Judaism. That included Yitro, included his daughter uh, uh, Tzipora, that was the wife of Moshe Rabbeinu, and included Moshe Rabbeinu, and included all of Am Yisrael. We all accepted the Torah at that time, and hence the reason why, t- till this day, there are two ways of being Jewish. Either your mother is Jewish, and therefore you are Jewish, or you convert to Judaism by accepting the entire Torah. But nonetheless, one of the things that we do is we celebrate. We celebrate this special day. This is actually a very special day for the entire world, but also a very unique day for converts that uh, are, uh, should know that this is a unique time. Now, the, uh, the beautiful part of the Torah is that it's, uh, it's never-ending. There's a, a lot going on. There's a, uh, a lot of moving parts. And when I was thinking about what to talk about tonight, because there are so many moving parts, I know that there's one pressing topic that is constantly on people's mind is money. Uh, money, business, work, uh, business decisions, all types of things. The stock market is up. The stock market is down. All of these different things. And of course... Before we uh, get into the uh, the holiday of uh, of uh, Shavuot, the Rambam paskins la lacha, that before uh, Yom Tov, as part of the preparation for Yom Tov, we have to give tzedakah, we have to to uh, uh, invest in Torah and p- help the poor. Uh, you know, money is constantly involved in our life. And quite frankly, one of the things that I've uh, found and I've learned is that uh, really there's money says a lot about a person. And, but one thing that uh, always stood in my mind is this uh, unique Gemara that uh, you find in Masechet Shabbat, page 31a, where the Gemara says something really extraordinary. We've mentioned in the past, but I've always thought about it in a certain way, but B'siyat Dishmaya today, uh, perhaps we'll look at it in a slightly different way, uh, where in the name of Rava, says that when a, uh, a person dies and he's uh, going to his uh, judgment in, uh, you know, after his death in the, uh, in the court of heaven, the uh, heavenly tribunal says to him, did you conduct your business transactions with emunah? Did you set aside fixed times for Torah? Did you engage in procreation? Did you wait in hope of the messianic salvation? Did you delve into wisdom? When you learned Torah, did you learn it deeply and infer one thing from another? But if so, all this is only of limited consequence if fear of God was this person's uh, storehouse. If yes, then it'll have a favorable judgment. And if not, then the judgment is not favorable. In so many words, the Gemara tells us that as soon as a person goes up to Shemaim, he's, he or she is asked the series of questions about uh, the, the Mashiach, the, the, uh, the, the, their time of learning Torah, the, whether they uh, try to have children, all of these different things. And of course, 
the foundation of everything is did you have Yirat Shemaim? Did you have fear of the Almighty? Because if you did, then surely that fear of the Almighty uh, made sure that whatever actions you did, you did uh, were, were the right thing. And if you didn't have fear of the Almighty, then we have to investigate every single little act because surely there is going to be a uh, problem it's going to be damage it's going to be mold spiritual mold in your actions if there's no yirat shamayim even your learning of torah could be for the sake of honor could be for the sake of money could be for the sake of uh, uh, debating uh, uh, people and to show yourself as if you're a, uh, smarter than people the point being is is that if there's no fear of heaven then uh, all of our que- all of our actions even the good ones are questionable now this so far we've already reviewed in the past but the one thing that uh, we see here is that when we think of, of, of what's going to happen when we go up to Shemaim, uh, and needless to say, what's going to happen when Mashiach comes, if we have the merit to, uh, to see Mashiach, uh, it's a, in essence, there's multiple judgments. There's the judgment in uh, the time of Mashiach, there's the judgment of uh, when a person dies, and there's also a judgment of the, uh, you know, Yom Adina Gadol, which is a, uh, you know, when after the whole messianic uh, time is, uh, in essence, gets to uh, its culmination. And there's the resurrection of the dead. Now, the point being is, is that we're going to be asked these questions. But regardless of who and what you are, you have to deal with the fact that the first question the Gemara says that a person is asked is how did you manage your money how did you conduct your business how did you operate how did you function when it came to the issues of money and of course you could say what we've said in the past that if a person it says that you conduct your uh, business with emuna with faith meaning did you uh, 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 steal money did you uh, have emuna and hashem that everything's going to be okay all of these things are correct but also further, when we think about it, is that why is it the first question? Why isn't, did you learn Torah, or did you think about Mashiach now, or did all of the other questions? Why is money the first question? And in fact, it's because money tells us a lot about a person. The more you know about how a person operates when it comes to money, the more you know how the person is. If money is the top priority of their life, you already know where their spiritual status is. You know what, where, uh, you know which direction they're going to vote, where they're going to live, which friends they're going to associate with, uh, what things uh, are their priority in life. If a person makes money their uh, uh, their god, then surely you know that uh, they're in a very lowly state. If a person is careless about money, it uh, also tells you a lot about a person, and it's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, you can't necessarily be careless about money. Uh, you know, Chachamim were actually very, very uh, 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 careful with their money. Very, very careful with their money. Some of the stories that we hear about the sages and the Gemara, about how they acted with money, you would think that they, uh, uh, they, they lost their mind. But no, it's because they knew that to get panasa is a uh, is not such a simple thing a person uh, has to value whatever blessing hashem gives him and if he dis- disregards it and uh, and, and is uh, very uh, uh careless about the money when by taking uh, uh uh not taking care of the money by splurging it on nonsense uh by uh you know going to casinos and gambling and, and things of that nature going to prostitutes then shlomo melech already uh promises that this person will eventually lose all of his money needless to say if the person is involved in dishonest businesses and so on but the point being is is that when it comes to money there's a lot that we can learn about a person and there's a lot of different things that i have in front of me i don't know if Bezal Hashem we're going to have time to go over all of them but there's really different thoughts here there's different thoughts that uh we have that was from from different sfarim uh that we reviewed uh and uh, that really connect connect to to where we're at connect to where we're at now the uh Arab zilberstein in his uh extraordinary uh, uh series of sfarim called alenu uh if you've been to a jewish bookstore before you surely have seen these uh green books before uh it's a very famous series it's in hebrew it's in english and i'm sure it's probably in other languages also Arab zilberstein 
in this week's parasha, uh, in this week's parasha, parashat Bamidbar, uh, he brings uh, a couple of things. First, he says, if you notice that the uh, Nasi of the tribe of Gad, in this week's parashat Bamidbar, when they're uh, doing the census, the, uh, the Nasi of uh, the tribe of God is referred to as in two names. The first time he's referred to as a uh, uh, Elifa, Elisaf, Eliasaf ben Reuel. But then later on in Parashat Naso, he is uh, referred to as Eliasaf ben Deuel. So the Chachamim ask, why is the same exact person referred to in do, two different names? The Sefer Imre Noam that the Alenu uh, Shabach uh, brings writes that at the time of this census, Akadosh Baruch Hu chose leaders in each tribe, in each section, and he chose that the tribe of Dan was going to be the leader of the four divisions, subdivisions. And technically, the tribe of God could have complained about this. Because he should have been technically, if you're looking at uh, uh, a uh, firstborn rights, just like Dan was Bil'az firstborn, uh, uh, God was Zilpa's firstborn. So technically, the, the Nasi of God could have complained about this and protested. Why Why him? Why not me? He learns Torah, I learn Torah. He's a firstborn, I'm a firstborn. But what did the uh, leader of the tribe of God, Eliasaf, Ben Deuel do nothing. He did nothing. He simply knew that if this is what happened, this was the outcome, this is the will of Hashem. And he stayed quiet. And Akadosh Baruch Hu saw, Oh, I tested you. I gave your fellow what anybody else, including yourself, would want. And instead of complaining like everybody else, you simply accepted my judgment. You and I are friends. And therefore your name will change to Reuel. What's Reuel? The friend of God. The friend of God. Re, re is, a, is a friend. The friend of God. So we see here, Rabotai, that when a person accepts a decree uh, and, and in happiness, there's a significant value to it, and even more so when a person knows how to give in, to give in, whether it be in, uh, in one thing or another, in an argument, in a marriage, in a uh, shiduch, in a business partnership, in a business dispute. One of the uh, signs of a, uh, a, of a good dayan is, is one that's not necessarily always looking to, uh, uh, to prove one party right or another, but sometimes look to see if there could be a compromise where both parties uh, would in essence contribute and give in at the same time. And one of the beautiful things here you see that Rav Zilberstein brings is that he gives you examples of real life stories and he says that in the year 2003, 5763, there was an extraordinary Ben Torah, a Torah scholar that uh, got married uh, and uh, also, you know, found himself an extraordinary shiduch that the whole community was in awe about. All of the things were perfect, whether it was money, looks, yichus, everything was right. And this, this uh, chacham also was growing in Torah exponentially. And on top of that, everything was working for him. It seemed like as if everything he's touching was, was gold, was turning into gold. And it was unbelievable. And of course, people within the community... Uh, are always looking to see, okay, these tzaddikim did something. Why do I need to know that these tzaddikim did great things? Because I want to know what, uh, you know, what, what did they do that I could potentially repeat? Maybe I can't fast for a week at a time. Maybe I can't uh, finish the shas every single year. Maybe I can't do all of these great things. But sometimes you'll see that it's the small things that count the most. You know, it's it's a they, no one goes from uh, from nothing to full force on day one. But the point being is that a Kadosh Baruch Hu sends us different tests, and Rav Zilberstein brings the story of a Ben Torah that nearly twenty years ago it looked like everything was going for him, and people within the community were looking to see what is this young man's merit that a Kadosh Baruch Hu is blessing him so much, and his Rav 
tells the story. He says, you guys think that everything is going well for him now and you're asking, you think it started now? He goes, no, no. It started eight years ago. Eight years ago, this young man had a bar mitzvah. And to, you know, he studied for this bar mitzvah. He made sure that he knew the parasha and the aftara left and right. He spent an enormous amount of time and surely he wanted to make sure that He's going to do his bar mitzvah in his shul, in his community, with his family, with everybody knows him. He grew up there. But just so happened that his friend also had a bar mitzvah the same exact day. They have the same birthday. And he also studied. And he also worked hard. And he also lived in the same community. And of course, they have to have the bar mitzvah the same day, but uh, that doesn't work. Well, only one of you can read from the Torah. So they came to me, the Rav says. And I said to them, listen, you can do, you can uh, uh, do a lot for it. And uh, whoever wins, uh, like so, sort of like a coin toss, whoever wins uh, is going to get it. And as you would have it, our dear Chatan won. And later that night, the Chatan looked at himself in the mirror and he couldn't deal with it he couldn't deal with the fact that his friend is going to be sad on his bar mitzvah because the only other place that he could do his bar mitzvah is a relatively far away a completely different community where nobody knows him he can't change the day of bar mitzvah and uh he on the other hand will be happy because He's going to uh, get his bar mitzvah and everybody that knows him is going to see him. And he decided that night that no, he cannot come to terms with this. And the very next morning he told his friend, you can have it. You have the bar mitzvah in our shul and I'm going to do it at that faraway location. The look on his friend's face was extraordinary. The Rav says, I can't describe to you the joy that was the other boy felt when he learned that he would be able to celebrate his bar mitzvah in our shul. His face lit up and he couldn't stop thanking our chatan for the great favor he had done for him. And the Rav says that I decided after that to keep an eye, to keep an eye on this boy and watch how Hashem would eventually reward him for his noble deed. And I can testify that from that day on, he became a completely new person. He was successful in everything that he did, accomplishing great things both in learning Torah and in other endeav- endeavors. And this Shiduch, there was tremendous Siat Dishmaya. Certainly, there was a lot of hard work, but when a person looks above and knows that everything that he has is from a Kadosh Baruch Hu, including the tests including what sometimes looks like a blessing but is really not and sometimes what looks like a curse but in reality is a blessing a person that is committed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows exactly where his panasa, where his sustenance is coming from and anytime a person is uh, decides to give uh, to give in there is no way that that person is going to lose as a result. Now, we learned that in business, you're supposed to negotiate, be aggressive, uh, do whatever you can to win, but Torah teaches otherwise. In fact, uh, many times where doing all of those things would be the opposite uh, of, of to your benefit. So a person needs to first and foremost always ask themselves am i being honest or am i just looking to win despite breaking all boundaries of the torah as far as honesty is concerned and one of the things that a person uh, uh, can do is, is simply review their business and their business practices you know are you in a ethical business regardless of what business you're in there are many businesses that are ethical but people practice them in an unethical way you know, whether it be investments or it be banking or it be even a laundromat. There's a million different things that you can do 
in a ethical and unethical way but nonetheless there are certain businesses that are corrupt from from their nature the nature of the business itself is corrupt there is no way to do this business in an honest fashion and a person knows a person cannot fool themselves to think that if they do good things with their money then it allows them to continue their dishonest business practices if a person gives up being part of this dishonest business if they're doing it because they know that that's the will of Hashem that Hashem does not want them in this dishonest business does not want them in this corrupt business they can be assured that eventually they will be rewarded drastically more than they would have been had they stayed in that business now initially that may not look so initially you most likely it will not be so initially they're giving up a business where they're making a hundred two hundred three hundred thousand dollars a month just to get a job that they can barely make fifty thousand dollars a year so initially it looks literally like a financial tragedy but I could assure you that when you do the right things in accordance to the Torah you always win I give you an example that I gave years ago that uh, uh, you know when I was first starting in the business of, uh, of, of investments and so on one of the uh, uh, one of the difficult difficulties of that business is going through that first hurdle that first hurdle where you're working for other people you're doing all the work and they're getting all the money now and therefore many times when people finally break through that hurdle and finally start making money they forget about their values they forget about their conscience they're just so hungry for money that they don't care about the fact that they could easily be stealing from people and doing things that are dishonest doing things that are corrupt just because they're so hungry for money because they went through so much just to finally get to this point of course there's no permission for doing that there's no uh, uh, allowance to do such a thing and one of the things that I saw many many times is many people that started off in the business as decent people but as soon as they ran into money as soon as they started making a decent amount of money they would become corrupted they would become completely unethical they would become really horrible people uh that uh, you, you you would have sworn it's a completely different person that looks exactly like your former friend but every single person gets tested in every business and one of the things that I went through personally is that you know I went through a, a very difficult uh, several years where I got to the point where I couldn't afford to to buy food every day and I had to uh, uh, you know sneak on a bus and, and, and really struggled just to afford a donut and a coffee every day for a dollar but eventually it got to a point where I started making money but I never found you know myself in line with some of these other crooks that were looking to steal by default had no conscience whatsoever about the fact that they were doing things that were illegal corrupt unethical many times unethical doesn't always mean illegal uh, uh and it's and sometimes illegal is not necessarily unethical uh but nonetheless a person needs to know where they stand and why they stand and one of the things that my dear father taught us uh when we were very young is that you can do any business in the right way or the wrong way the uh, the wrong way you may succeed uh very quickly but your uh, uh your success is temporary whereas if you do things the right way meaning the honest way your success may take more time to get to but your success will be longer term and this is one thing that was engraved into my mind engraved into my heart where I was taught uh, good values at home and uh, therefore when I opportunities to do things that were wrong do things that were unethical needless to say do things that are illegal came to uh, to my desk it wasn't really necessarily much of a question uh but there were times where you look back you're like wow I can't believe I made that decision it could have been much much worse it could have been the other thing and two things that I can I can remember is that you know during the uh, uh, the crisis or when the crisis really started uh, in uh, 2008 2007 late 2007 begin 2008 uh, began there was a lot of opportunities for uh, for us to make money despite the fact that uh, this wouldn't necessarily be in hindsight it, 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 it could have been beneficial but it didn't look like it would be beneficial for customers uh but nonetheless it, it looked you know there was a lot of unethical things that a person could have done 
just to uh, save themselves. And in fact, when you were in a position where you built such a big business like I did at that time, I could have actually made a comp- huge fortune, tens of, of millions of dollars. And many times people will come to me and say, why don't you just sell? Why don't you just do this? And I would always tell them, listen, if I'm not doing it for my own money, I'm not, if I don't believe to do this for myself, I'm not going to do it for other people, even though doing it for other people would benefit me tremendously. Simple. I'd say it's, it's not to me. It didn't make uh, moral sense. Now, financial sense, it was a dumb decision. Why? Because you could have made, I don't know, 50, 100 million dollars by simply pressing a button. On the other hand, uh, it's, uh, you have to live with yourself. But again, you know, the, 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 uh, the memory is uh, short term, as they say. Needless to say, we stuck with our guns. I, I, I decided to do things that other people weren't willing to do because it was for the best interest of my clients. Now, to make that kind of a decision wasn't just the first thing that I ever did. It had, Hashem had to build me to that point. And there were many other things that happened before that that allowed me to make that decision, which was a very, very difficult one, but nonetheless to make that decision and give up literally on tens of millions of dollars just for the sake that from all uh, 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 perspectives, it looked like this was against the interest of the clients. It was against against the uh, 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 my morals and, 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 and it, it was against the truth. Point being is, is that it didn't, it's not something, Hashem doesn't give you the biggest test in the world on day one. What I remember is, is that in uh, 2002, I believe, 2002, 2003, um, you know, a few years already into actually making money finally, several years after, uh, you know, I already started in the business, I was already in the business for several years and then eventually started making money. And by then I was already making about a million dollars a year and I was only 22, 23 years old. And, uh, one of the people in the office, uh, told me that he has a friend that owns a firm that wants to offer me a deal to go leave the firm that I was in. Cause I was looking to leave and uh, to come work for him. And I obviously uh, took the call and uh, this guy offers me an opportunity and he tells me, listen, you know, you're making uh, good money or you have a business, you're making a million dollars a year. Well, how about I pay you $7 million cash? I can give it to you in a suitcase. I can give it to you a wire transfer, whichever way you want to come work for our firm. Now this, and I, you know, you look at, you know, as far as bottom line, wait, you're going to give me seven times what I made in one year. Sounds great. But then once I started hearing the details of his, uh, of, of his operation, I knew that immediately that his business was corrupt. I called him out on it and he says, whatever, but you know, you can do partial this, that. So no, I, simply put, no chance. Now for a 20-something year old kid that, yeah, has a little bit of money, but to give up that kind of money was, you know, again, not necessarily an easy decision. And many of the people in the office thought I was insane for giving up that kind of money. But when you have certain principles that you stand for, that you're not going to steal from people, you're not going to be corrupt. You're going to be honest, no matter what, you're always going to do your best. You're not going to, uh, step over people and step on people just for the sake of your success. These decisions of give a person an extraordinary amount of merit. Now it looks like, oh, it was a stupid decision. Why would you give up $7 million? Well, the truth is, is that many of those people that went to those firms ended up going to jail, ended up losing their license, ended up uh, uh, getting sued many times. I moved on with my career and eventually got to a point where I was making, uh, you know, uh, millions of dollars and and, and Baruch Hashem uh, got to a point of a lot higher success that I would have gotten had I went with that first choice, with that $7 million choice. But again, at that time, you don't know what Hashem is going to bring you. You don't know what the world is going to give you. And even uh, you don't know what your own talents are going to bring you. Everything can turn around in one day. But if you stand, stand with the direction of, of truth, especially when it comes to the truth of the Torah itself, HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not let you down. So the one of the most important things that I always want to remind people is that never let your obsession or even just simple desire for success your ambition get in the way of your morals you know it's 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 sad to see that many times people get their you know move from a ambitious uh uh uh, mindset 
into an obsessive mindset and that obsessive mindset starts ripping through all moral values that exist everything that they learned why because they want to reach a target and so they don't mind you know killing somebody on the way financially or even physically they don't mind stealing they don't mind uh, cheating they don't mind doing a lot of different things because they're obsessed with a certain goal and they think that this is necessary and the truth is it's not necessary the most successful people in history and uh, if you want to calculate whether it be the Forbes 500 of today or the Forbes 500 of yesteryear you see that many of these people although some of them have questionable acts and some of them have questionable deals and so on generally speaking it they did not acquire that extraordinary success uh by corruption perhaps they used that success for corruption but acquiring that success many times was not through that surely there are always exceptions to the story but the the biggest thing is is that Akadosh Baruch Hu's stamp is truth and when you go with the truth when you are not going to forsake the the morals that every normal person should know surely you're going to win in the end now one of the things that a person uh, uh needs to always remind himself is where the money is really coming from meaning it's uh as much as a person would like to believe that he's talented and that he's smart and he's at the right place at the right time he always has to remind himself every single morning I, I thank you Hashem I thank you Hashem for bringing back my neshama for giving me an, another opportunity because you uh, have faith in me point being is is that you have to always remember that everything you have whether it's the breath in your lungs or it's the vision that your eyes see or it's anything else including the money that you just got from some customer or you got from some deal or some investment all of that comes from Hashem and the way that you remember it is number one number one always make sure that whatever you're doing is morally correct according to the Torah itself and not according to your ambitions always compare it to what the Torah allows and what it doesn't allow don't let your ambitions and your desire and your lust for success get in the way of your morals because eventually it doesn't pay eventually Kadosh Baruch Hu closes all of the corruption he closes all of the, the the mafiosos he closes up all of the thieves eventually the end is not good every every old timer that was in the corruption business of some kind can tell you his war stories of how they used to do this and they used to do that and eventually it all came to an end eventually it all comes to an end the beauty is when somebody does things the right way they can actually write home uh, about it they can be proud about it even if eventually they failed in some way or it was taken from them in some way they can always be proud of who they were and what they did they, they, you know if a person is not proud enough of what he does surely it's not it's it, there's a problem with it one of the uh, uh, uh extraordinary stories that I heard from Rav Ovadia Alava Shalom was uh that in Yeshivat Porat Yosef there was a very unique Gabai very unique Gabai in that Yeshiva who was a uh, former businessman in Turkey Jewish man at the time uh in, in, in years ago there used to be a, a huge community uh of Jews in Turkey many Chachamim came from Turkey and uh here this this Gabai would uh would uh, tell the uh Bachurim and the uh, yeshiva about how he used to be a businessman he was dealing with apparel and you know different fabrics and he would get custom orders from different places companies and so on and uh at one time they asked this goodbye well, what's a uh what's one thing that you know st- you know stands in your heart all the time he says every time i pray every time i pray i think about my business but you're now you're a goodbye to the you're a goodbye to yeshiva what are you thinking about the business that you had you know 20 years ago 15 years ago what because no no you don't understand you pray i pray we both pray your prayer is worth x amount but you don't know how much i know how much money is worth explain so this holy gabai says in turkey i was made sure that i always prayed on time prayer to akadosh bahu with a minyan was priority no question asked 
Now, of course, you want to make parnasa, you want to make a living, needless to say, if there's a big opportunity, but I never let that get in my way. But one day, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent me a test. I'm in my factory, and in comes this very respectable sergeant. And he says to me, I am the sergeant of one of the uh, uh, sections of the army of Turkey. And I need to get new uniforms for the entire army. And uh, I'd like to order from you. I said to him, oh, I said that, but uh, is it possible for you to wait 25 minutes for me to come back? And the sergeant looks at me funny. What? 25 minutes? You know how much? That's a lot of time. I need to go. What do you mean 25? I need to buy now. Make it a big purchase. He said, I understand. But can you wait 25 minutes? Absolutely not. I cannot wait 25 minutes. Now or never? And the goodbye says to him, I'm sorry then. It would have to be never because I have to go pray. The general got so upset with this Jew that he immediately walked out and Dafka went to his competitor that was next door and ordered everything from him. The Gabai says, when I went to pray that night, I was smiling the whole way because I knew that for the first time in my life, my prayer is worth a fortune. The fortune I just gave up. We're talking about a huge fortune for entire army uniforms. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not forget, did not let me down. Apparently in Shemaim, it was already written for me to get a certain amount of panasa. The question is, option A or option B? Option A, by going after my desires, my ambitions, and thereby forsaking the Torah, chas v'shalom. Option B, sanctifying a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name, and thereby getting greater reward in this world and the next. And what ended up happening is that months passed, and eventually that same general came back into my factory. And this time his face was very different. This time he talked to me very differently, very respectfully. And he said, listen, I ordered from your competitor. His merchandise is very bad quality. I know that this is the place. I know that you have a good reputation for making good things. And I want to order the whole thing all over again. And this time I'm going to give you much more than what I was willing to give you before. It almost ended up being four times as much. Four times as much as what he was willing to pay me before. Meaning not only did this person ended up getting a fortune of money as a result of standing up for praying, praying with the minyan, going and standing up for Hashem and not doing uh, business uh, uh, and forsaking the Torah in the process, but even more so, he's literally one of the few people on planet Earth that ever knew how much money, how much reward each one of his prayers is worth. Because if you're willing to give up millions of dollars just for the sake of going and praying, that means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to pay you for that prayer each time. Pay you for that prayer each time in, in, in the eternal world. So again, it's important for a person to be morally right when it comes to the law of the land, when it comes to the, uh, the, the, the compliance and things of that nature. But more than anything else, always remember where that money is coming from and why. Another thought is what a person does with their money. What a person does with their money is important because, again, it tells a person uh, who he is and what he feels about this money. The Midrash Rabbah in Parashat uh, Bamidbar, this week's parasha, says in the name of Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi that if the nations of the world had known how beneficial the Bet HaMikdash was for them, they would have surrounded it with fortification to protect it. For the Bet HaMikdash was in fact more beneficial for the Goim, for the other nations, than it was for Israel. Because Shlomo HaMelech prayed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that any time a non-Jew would come to the Bet HaMikdash 
and pray for Hashem to bring him salvation, Hashem will answer his prayer. But not necessarily every time for a Jew. Because sometimes a Jew is asking for a certain thing that is bad for him. So Shlomo Melech prayed to Hashem. If the Jew asks to marry this woman, it's not good for him. He asks for this money and it's not good for him. He asks for this thing and it's not good for him. Please, Hashem, don't give it to him. But for the non Jews, give them whatever they want. Why? So they never say, oh, these Jews, they pray to nothing. Their God doesn't even answer. In essence, it, the, the Bet HaMikdash, prayer at the Bet HaMikdash was even more beneficial for the non-Jews. Had they known about it, they would have never destroyed it. And needless to say, they would have actually protected it. But over here, the Midrash says further that we see one major lesson from this. What do we see? Akadosh Baruch Hu would not give him, uh, would, would not give the world rain even, if not for Am Yisrael. Even rain, rain coming to the world in India, rain coming in the world in Los Angeles, rain coming into the world in uh, Guam, will not come to the world if it's not for Am Yisrael. Meaning that the attitude that a person has towards money has to be in such a fashion that yes i'm going to work not just to pay for my mortgage or rent and and to buy food so we can eat no 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 i'm going to go make money so i can take a portion of that money and invest it into am israel connecting to akadosh baruch to his torah i'm going to take a portion of that money so I can invest it in Am Yisrael, being Am Yisrael. Not to go help Am Yisrael go to the zoo. Not to go help Am Yisrael go and swim in the middle of summer, boys and girls, Hashem Yerachim. Not to go and invest in Am Yisrael doing a, a, a parade with the Israeli flag and the rest of the Zionists that don't know even Aleph Bet. No! I'm going to invest this money that I worked the whole week for, that I worked the whole month for, I only want this money why so i could use this money to help am israel get closer to akadosh baruch Hu. now surely there's a lot of different things that a person can do to help am israel get closer to akadosh baruch Hu, but not necessarily everyone that says that they're helping people get closer to hashem are actually doing so many times people call things kiruv people call things limut torah People call things, you know, uh, outreach work, but in reality, the, the results speak for themselves. If you see that there is a lot of people going to a certain uh, uh, synagogue, going to a, uh, doesn't necessarily always mean that uh, it's, the, it, it's positive results. Just today, one of my students sent me a new up-and-coming speaker, up-and-coming speaker that is getting 20 or 40 young kids to, uh, to listen to his complete nonsense, telling the kids, he himself is a young kid, telling the kids, by the way, I decided that to be Shomer Nagia is not for me. I'm not being honest for myself. Because if I'm Shomer Nagia, that means that I can't save somebody else's life. The level of stupidity that came out of this young man's mouth, I would be, I would be baffled if he ever read a single page in the Chumash. But he is claiming to be teaching Torah. And he's outreach. Outreach maybe to Gehenom, not to not or to Kafakela, not to Gan Eden. So the point is that not all things are alike. Other times you see people say, listen, we're being honest here. We're teaching Torah in the name of the Hasidut, in the name of this, in the name of that. And you see these people acting the exact opposite of their so-called holy teachers. Their teachers are holy, but they're not really their teachers. They're quoting Rabbi Nachman. They're quoting the Lubavitcher Rebbe. They're quoting Rabbi Vadia. They're quoting the biggest tzaddikim in the world. But they're not like them. How do you know? Simply look at them. Simply hear what the words that are coming out of their mouth. If you see a person acting like an angel, in essence, literally sacrificing everything for the sake of observing the Torah, that's somebody that you can listen to. But if you see somebody that openly proudly and nonchalantly carelessly violating the torah she walks around with a wig longer than the exile you're gonna listen to her he walks around like he just came out of some filthy runway show you're gonna listen to him 
she walks around with no arms and no legs you're gonna listen to her what are you listening to or the best yet there's one particular person someone showed me he's teaching to her for many years he happens to also curse and uses foul language in his shurim but nonetheless they still call him a rabbi Karim, you have to understand you cannot lie to yourself don't look for somebody like you to learn from look for somebody that you should be like you look for somebody that is like the closer to what the sages are not somebody that's where you are today because you can relate to him because he wears sneakers and you wear sneakers he likes fast cars and you like fast cars she looks like she came out of some magazine and you want to look like you shouldn't came out of the magazine that's not the way to learn a person has to be honest with themselves and needless to say the money that you are making is only going to have bracha if number one you're making it in a honest moral fashion and number two you are investing it in honest and moral places to donate money or to give money or even to buy the books of people that are corrupt is 100 percent a sinful act that rabbi nachman mibreslev writes in lekute maharan is the equivalent of wasting seed why seed is the sustenance that akadosh Baruch Hu gives a person when a person donates that sustenance to the wrong place it is the same thing rabbi nachman says as if a person wasted their seed their other sustenance so when a person before they buy books of heretics before they donate to people that are antithetical to the torah before they go to events by such people and contribute in any way shape or form they have to think twice if they want this sin on their on their account oh i didn't know now you know it's very important for a person to be honest with themselves there was one time i uh, that i learned this and in, the, in, in a very very uh, uh uh strict way if you you can say when we were dealing with this a uh, uh, uh missionaries and so on one of the times i asked robert frame why don't we get their book review it and thereby uh uh you know then we could dispute everything he asked me sure but can we get it for free i said no it's 15 dollars he said to me and i said what it's 15 i have 15 dollars you know 15 he goes no chas for shalom he says even if it was one dollar you can't give it to them one dollar you can't give it to them why that that takes something a who gave you a blessing a who gave you and gives it to the Rashaim. it's like giving the, 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 the nazi a gun yeah but it's only 15 dollars you only need one bullet you only need one bullet a person needs to know that when it comes to their money they have to be very very careful with it needless to say when it comes to their time and otherwise now when a person looks at things he sees that the sages also conducted business but they conducted business in a very different way their blessing was extraordinary at times but nonetheless tested in the sefer anaf etz avot by rabu vadya in the uh, Mishnah, in Perik Aleph, Mishnah 9, he brings a story about Shimon ben Shetach, that's in the Gemara, in the Yerushalmi, in Masechet Brachot. Shimon ben Shetach was one of the Gdolei Ador, was the head of the Sanhedrin. But not only that, Shimon ben Shetach was a very, very poor, extraordinarily poor. And one time his students wanted to or they saw that he's struggling and he's getting older and they wanted to help the rabbi and they said can we buy you a donkey can we buy this can we give this he says no 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 i don't want anything don't buy me anything i don't so okay can we at least get a donkey for the rav he said okay go to the arab and get a donkey i'll buy a donkey they went to the arab and they bought a donkey they come back on the way they see that the donkey has something dangling on his uh, on his neck they open up the little bag and they see it's a huge diamond worth a fortune immediately the talmidim are excited why for their rabbi today you know i would be uh, amazed if the talmidim 
ever arrive with that diamond for their rabbi. Perhaps the donkey, but not the diamond. But nonetheless, they come to the rabbi and say, Kvod Rab, we have fantastic news. What's the news? The donkey. No, 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 not the donkey. The donkey came with a present from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Here it is. Shimon ben Shatach says, where'd you get that? Came with a donkey? He says, yeah. He goes, no, no, I didn't buy a diamond. I bought a donkey. He said, but yeah, Kvod Rab, it's, it's, Hashem is giving you a blessing. You could even halachically, you could, you could take it. It's tauta goy. It's the mistake of a, of a non-Jew. You're allowed to technically benefit from it. Shimon ben Shatach says to his Talmidim, do you think Shimon ben Shatach, he talks about himself in the third person, you, talk, you think Shimon ben Shatach is looking for riches? I only bought a donkey. And I'm only looking to sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name in this world. That's it. Immediately he went with his Talmidim to this Arab and said, here you go, I only bought a donkey, this is your diamond. The Arab from that day on would walk in the markets saying, blessed is the God of Shimon ben Shatach. Blessed is the God of Shimon ben Shatach. Literally a Kiddush Hashem. Now this very same Shimon ben Shatach had tests. Had tests other than just this one. And one time, 300 Nezirim, people that made a vow not to cut their hair, not to drink wine, and uh, came to the Bed Din of Shimon ben Shatach and uh, came to the Sanhedrin. Problem is that in order for their vows to end, they have to bring three different types of sacrifices. And all 300 of these Nezirim were poor. They didn't have any money. Now Shimon ben Shatach also doesn't have any money. Needless to say, not for, four, for, for 900 cows. So he went to his brother-in-law. Who was his brother-in-law? Yanai the king. Yanai was a king and he was filthy rich. That's his brother-in-law. So Shimon ben Shatach was the, one of the uh, advisors of the king too. Because he was his brother-in-law and he was the Gdolado. And he says to Yanai the king, Listen, we have 300 Nezirim that are poor. And in order for their uh, 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 vow to end, they need to bring sacrifices. Why don't you pay your half and I pay my half? Yanai said, okay, no problem. He commanded his, uh, his people, give, uh, give Shimon ben Shatach the 450 cows that he wants or uh, uh, animals that he needs for half of the 300 people. Now the other, now he has money for half. What about the other half? Before he went to Yanai, he looked for different halachic reasons, valid reasons of if he can cancel any of the vows because there was a mistake, what's called mekach ta'ut. There was an original mistake in the vow itself and thereby the vow was really never valid to begin with. And he found that 150 of them were not valid vows and therefore they don't need to bring any sacrifice they don't need to cancel anything in fact everything that they did was for naught but nonetheless they go back to regular life so now that the anai the king brought him uh, the uh, the uh, what was needed for half of them and the other half were already uh, canceled out everybody's free to go but of course there's always reshaim out there and they come to anai the king and they tell him you know this Shimon ben Shatach, this advisor of yours, you know, he cheated you, right? How did he cheat me? You gave money for half the people, the Nazarites. He didn't give any money. What do you mean he didn't give money? He said, give me half and I'll give half. Yeah, he didn't give any money. Freedom. That's it. Immediately, Anai was a hothead. Got angry and put a warrant for the arrest of, uh, of Shimon ben Shatach. Shimon ben Shatach knew that his life was on the line. He fled, ran away. Some time passed, and some people from uh, some uh, dignitaries from a different country came to visit Yanai the king. And uh, when they saw him, they said, Oh, your highness, the last time we visited you, you had a very wise advisor. 
someone that we've never seen such wisdom uh, sitting right next to you what happened with him of course and i knew that they were talking about shimon ben shatach a genius and immediately he told his wife who was shimon ben shatach's sister he told his wife go send out a message to your uh, brother in his hiding spot wherever he's hiding and tell him that he can come back be in my palace i won't do any harm to him and here's my signet ring that is uh, you can give it to him as uh, this is a uh, you know the uh, uh promising that i won't do anything to him this is the guarantee shimon ben shatach got the message came back to the palace after he came back to the palace he sat he saw that the king the queen which is a sister shimon ben shatach took a chair and put right between them and he sat there between them and i found this amusing and he says to him why did you cheat me shimon ben shatach says to him i never cheated you me cheat he says yeah but you said you pay half and i pay half you didn't pay any money he says uh, your highness no i said you pay half i pay half you paid with what god gave you which is the money i paid with what god gave me which is the torah i used the torah wisdom that i learned that i toiled for that i sacrificed everything for to do the same exact thing just like the torah commands us to your currency is money my currency is torah so and I says to him you answered wisely so why did you flee he says because that very same torah taught me that when someone is angry you can't rationalize with him i knew my life was on a line you wouldn't hear me he says okay then why did you sit between me and the queen he says because the very same torah that we're talking about says that when you have torah wisdom you'll sit in between the the uh, the the kings and that's what i'm doing shimon ben shatach acted in accordance to the torah now of course in the business world today people sometimes think that the business is only speaks in dollars and cents and the truth is that if a person follows the torah there are plenty of opportunities for that person to bring panasa to bring bracha to bring a lot of good things to their life it's all based on how loyal a person is to a kadosh baruch Hu. are you going to sell a shem for those few dollars are you going to sell a shem for that uh, ambitious desire that you have do you really think you could succeed without a shem and that's one of the things that a person needs to always ask themselves one of the things that people need to know is that in order for us to get a real blessing we have to make sure that we're not only following hashem's ways by doing mitzvot investing in torah investing in helping people do tshuva but also staying away from sins and cleaning up as much as we possibly can rabbi udaftaya in ruchot mesaprot in minchat yehuda in, in english he brings a story that he saw himself he says there were times that people came after they learned the significance of what a sin is and what punishment they would get and they would try to do tshuva and they would even try to do tikkunim he says there was one time there was an old man that came to me and he says that uh in uh, the year 1923 5683 an old man came to me and told me that he had uh, lain with his daughter-in-law while his son was alive and that he was incapable of uh the uh mortifications of wearing a sackcloth and sleeping in ashes and all the different tikkunim that uh, he would do himself and he want to do a tikkun with money so i told him exactly what he needs for this particular sin to clean himself up he has to bring a certain amount of money and uh we'll do the tikkun for him some time passed and this old man he says came back to see me with enough money for this tikkun and he brought 320 uh to replace 325 fasts which is for uh eshet ish so i did the tikkun for him but after i did it 
I realized that this old man was very poor and that he actually ended up borrowing the money that he gave me in order to do the tikkun. So I took all the money that he gave me with the exception of two pennies and gave it back to him as tzedakah. Showing that when a person is doing tikkun, in reality he's doing it for himself, so much so that when a person really knows the value of this, they'll literally even uh, borrow money if they understood what's on the line. But needless to say, the rabbis, the chachamim, that help people do tikkunim, they're not getting rich off of this because this money goes, the whole point is for this money to go towards charity, to go help other people. So Rabbi Yudhaftai was going to give this money, not for himself to go make money. He was going to give it to charity, go give it to poor people. But when he realized the guy that did the tikkun is the poor person, he just gave it back to him. Now the question is, how do we know that how do we know the tikkun worked? Read the rest of the story. Rabbi Yudhaftai says, two years later, the old man passed away, and I saw him in a dream, standing before the celestial court. And they observed him and saw that he was a penitent, except that he had repented only for having been with the married woman, but he did not do tshuva for the transgression of having been with his own daughter-in-law. But they didn't say one word to him about his single transaction, meaning his single transgression, meaning this guy was a tzaddik. This old man was a righteous person. He made a mistake, a big mistake. But we're talking about one sin we're talking about. We're not talking about a whole life of sins. He did a tikkun for being with a married woman, with Rabbi Yudhaftaya, but he didn't do a tikkun with being with his daughter-in-law, which is a completely separate sin. Uh, Parashat uh, uh, Achareh talks about how uh, uh, the different immoralities and uh, uh, arayot, and one of them is being with a daughter-in-law. So there was still a sin left on his account. And they didn't even mention the sin of the married woman, which is much greater. So what happens? He sees all of this in a dream. They did not say one word to him about his transgression. And he on his own, with no further conversation, entered a room in the celestial court that was on the side of the court compound. The room was pitch dark without even a mat to sit on. He entered and sat down on his knees in the corner of the room. The court looked upwards and three angels from the heavens above the court descended immediately. These angels are known to be master physicians and expert surgeons. They entered the room where the old man was, closed the door and performed an operation on his organ, on his breet, removing the rust and the flaw that was on the organ and they healed him entirely and departed this is what i saw says rabbi Yudhaftaya. this should make a person appreciate the precious magnificence of tshuva of repentance and its magnitude for it saved the old man from a sentence of several hundred years in kafakela which he had deserved as well as a number of years he had deserved to be reincarnated in a mineral or a vegetable or an animal or a different human then after being reincarnated in a mineral vegetable animal or another human he would have entered genom since the judgment in genom follows the reincarnation in a mineral vegetable animal and human as it's written in shah gilgulim preface 22 uh, um, page 21b which says one hour of repentance and good deeds in this world surpasses all of life in the world to come. And it goes on and on and on of different tikkunim. Rabbi Yudhaftayah mentions about being with a married woman, 325 fast, being a, a homosexual, 233, wasting seed, 84, and so on and so forth. The point being is, if a person thinks that the rabbis are making money out of their tikkunim, not only are they mistaken about what the rabbis are doing, unless the rabbis are corrupt. If they're corrupt, then why are you donating in the first place? But not only are they wrong about the rabbis, they're wrong about the magnitude of their own sins. This righteous person made a mistake. Look what happened. Had to happen. 
for that. Now, this is not coming from some fairy tale. This is Rabbi Yudah Ftai. It's one of the Gdule Ador Rabotai 100 years ago. Less than 100 years ago. So, the, the, the amazing thing is, today we live in, in, a, in a world so full of ignorance that you would never imagine, you would never imagine that people, uh, uh, you know, uh, even give themselves the, the, uh, the, the right to call themselves uh, teachers. Because many times people teach people to give, but they don't really give them the reason why. Many times people tell people to come learn, but they don't necessarily teach them what they're really supposed to learn. A person needs to know when you're conducting business and you're making money, that money is not just to make you fatter. That money needs to be for helping others do tshuva, for helping there be more Torah, not necessarily because you are in love with the Torah so much and so on, but it's for yourself. It's all investing into yourself. It's all investing into yourself. Now you're going to say, wait a minute, but sometimes you have certain people that get blessings. Sure. And it doesn't seem like they got, they did anything for it. You're right. It doesn't seem. There always is some reason. But for those that speculate there could be a reason and those that speculate that such and such person, there really isn't a valid reason for them. Know this. If they are a righteous person, then surely there is a reason of why Kadosh Baruch Hu blessed them. If there are a wicked person, then Rabbi Yudaftaya writes also in Ruchot Mesaport, and many other Chachamim, and the Gemara Masechet Sanedrin, and many other places talks about how wicked people get punished by getting blessings because a Kadosh Baruch Hu simply decides to pay them their reward in this world. Where he writes in the same chapter 88, page 416, Ever not only the wicked receive their reward in this world, and the righteous receive their punishment in this world. And therefore, when a wicked person abandons his evil ways and repents, his sins decrease and his merits increase. And if he has not affected the tikkunim, the rectifications, and kept the fast as prescribed by the Ari Kadosh, then suffering befalls him as a matter of course, as mentioned concerning the four types of atonement. And he will appear like one who has burned the entire Torah. As written in the Talmud, quoted above. Further, he says that a person that is a uh, totally wicked, it seems like his life was tranquil, calm, honored, healthy, wealthy. He doesn't realize that before if he didn't before he did tshuva god was rewarding him for the commandments being fulfilled in this world and all of his sins were saved for the next world as it's written parashat Hanan, he repays his enemies forthwith to ruin them he does not demur with his enemies but repays them right away this is uh Dvarim, deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 10 that god does not withhold the reward for any creature Meaning that a person that looks like he's doing great financially and so on, but he's against God, nothing to be jealous about. Why? This person is in essence getting reward for all of the good things in this world and all of the punishment he's going to get for the punishment, Hashem is saving for the next world, which is impossible to, 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 to quantify. If you just understand that one sin we talked about, what a person gets, surgery on a member, Shem Yishmov Now, a person that is a, uh, uh, the Gemara brings, Masechet Sanhedrin, page 44. A person that was a uh, Jewish tax collector, wicked, got a uh, impressive burial that was switched with a righteous person. The Talmudim of this righteous person cried, and he came to them in a dream and says, No, don't worry. In Shamaim, I'm in Gan Eden, I'm doing great. Yeah, but why did this wicked tax collector get such an, you know, such an impressive uh, burial and you didn't? So, oh, because this wicked tax collector, he made 
couple of mitzvot in his life, so Hashem wanted to make sure that everything he was owed, he's going to get in that world, because now all he has is punishment. Last but not least, Rabotai, it's a chidush that I had today, Siyat Dishmaya. We see that in this week's parasha, parashat by Midbar, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says in a uh, chapter 3, in uh, verses uh, 12 and on, that Hashem speaks to Moshe saying, And I, behold, I have taken the Leviim from among the children of Israel in place of every firstborn, the first opener of the womb among the children of Israel, and the Leviim shall be mine. For every firstborn is mine. On the day I struck every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified every firstborn in Israel for myself, from man to animal. They shall be mine. I am Hashem. So here we see that Hashem made a switch. Initially, the Kohanim, if you will, were the firstborn, firstborn males. But after the sin of the golden calf, HaKadosh Baruch Hu switched the right of the firstborn, that special position of the firstborn was taken away from them and given to the Levim, making them into Kohen. A Levi is a Kohen. You know, the Moshe Rabbeinu was both a Levi and a Kohen. Aaron a Kohen was a Levi and a Kohen. So they, in essence, the uh, um, the uh, Levim didn't have this until now. Why did Kadosh Baruch Hu do it? The golden calf sin removed the uh, uh, the blessing that the firstborn had. They got punished. But why did the Levim get it? Because the Levim, not only did they not sin with the golden calf, but when Moshe Rabbeinu came down and he says, whoever is for God, come with me, kill whoever was a, uh, worship this idol, this golden calf, even if he's your brother, even if it's your sister, even if it's this, even if it's that. And the Levim took the, the swords and started killing people in the name of Hashem. Meaning they put their lives on the line. They put their lives on the line for the sake of Hashem. So what do we learn from this? What's the Chidush? Chidush is as follows. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives blessings. The Rabbi Nachum in Breslev and other uh, Gdolim in the world of Hasidut say that in essence this is Matanat Chinam. There's free blessings everywhere. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives free blessings everywhere. But those free blessings are conditional. They're not really free. You get them for free so long as you comply with the terms that are strict at times. And the second you violate those terms, Hashem removes the blessing instantly. Just like He did for the firstborn. The firstborn didn't do anything to be firstborn. They didn't choose to be firstborn. You can't pray to be firstborn. So you're just born firstborn. So the second they violated those terms, that blessing that Hashem gave them was taken away from them and is only going to be given back to them in a certain format after Mashiach comes. Not that the Kohanim are not going to be Kohanim anymore, but the firstborn will have additional rights they know they don't have anymore. Nonetheless, that's because it was a free gift. A free gift that was conditional and the second you violate that condition, it's gone. What about the Kohanim? Many Kohanim didn't end up be uh, tzaddikim like Aaron Cohen and his sons. Some of these Kohanim were shayim. The Gemara in Masechet um, uh, in uh, Masechet Yoma talks about how there was a uh, period uh, in the second Bet Hamikdash. There were over 300 Kohanim, meaning the Kohen was such a wicked Kohen, he, every year he would die. The, the person would die every year. They would have to replace him with somebody else because they were buying the, the, the priesthood. They were not uh, actually qualified to be priesthood. They were just had money. So not every Kohen was righteous. So how come HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't remove the priesthood from the Kohanim anymore? Simple. They earned it through sacrifice. They earned it through sacrifice 
when a person gets the blessing from Akadosh Baruch Hu due to his sacrifice, due to his major efforts, that blessing is eternal. Just like the Kohanim will always be Kohanim, Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Akohen will live forever. He's Eliyahu Navi. Why? He sacrifices life. Moshe Rabenu, Moshe Rabenu, Isha Elokim, forever. No one's ever going to be a prophet like Moshe Rabenu, not even Mashiach. Why? Sacrificed his life. Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov sacrificed everything. Kadosh Baruch Hu blesses them forever. The merit of Akedat Yitzchak forever. The, when a person sacrifices for the sake of the Torah, the blessing they get is permanent. That means, Rabotai, when we are waking up in the morning, we go to work, we do whatever it is that we do, we sell tires, we, we pick up garbage, we sell, uh, I don't know, whatever it is that you do for a living. You work as an engineer, you work uh, as an analyst of some kind, you cut hair, whatever it is that you do. If you are going to take that money and simply just eat with it, simply just, just live with it for yourself, just pay for yourself, you're not doing anything for the sake of Hashem, you're doing it for your own stomach. But if you take a portion of that money and you literally sacrifice your pleasures for the sake of Torah, you also conduct business according to the Torah, which in essence looks like it's going to make you less money. And in essence, that in itself is also a sacrifice because if you go with the corrupt people, you can make 10 times more. But no, you stay straight. That's a sacrifice. That's a sacrifice. Your client made a mistake. He's a non-Jew. You're allowed to take advantage of it, but you don't, and you give him the money back. You sacrifice for the sake of sanctifying Kadosh Baruch Hu's name. All of those sacrifices, they add up, Rabotai. They add up, and they add up, and eventually the blessing comes. And when it comes, it's not temporary. You don't have to worry about losing it anymore. Why? It's yours. You paid for it with blood. And then you realize, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is literally looking for ways to give us good. It's only in our hands to listen to Him and use His instructions in order to earn the good that He wants to give us. That, Rabotai, is the reason why no person on earth that knows who God is the knows his Torah would ever in their right mind go against the Torah not in the private life not in the business life why you lose and not just because of genom and kafakela and pun you lose here the biggest loser can sometimes look like a winner but eventually a kadosh Baruch Hu exposes them too Whereas the biggest winner, that's the one that's with Hashem. Always. Despite the difficulty and the test. And surely one that sticks to that, sticks with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, will live to tell the story one day to encourage the next generation to do the same as Hashem. With that being said, I'm going to take a little drink and then you guys can ask some questions. Okay, let's see. Uh, oh, David, you like my singing? <laughs> Thank you. It's funny. Uh, okay, Jeremy, how will people know when the real Eliyahu Navi is here? What Gilgul will he appear in, and how will he differentiate himself from all the other fakers in the past? Uh, good question. One of the things that uh, uh, that Akadosh Baruch Hu promises us in uh, the book of Jeremiah is that the, when the salvation comes, meaning Mashiach, 
it, it, it's not going to be a question anymore of who's Mashiach and so on, because the miracles and the things that will happen at that time will be greater than what happened in Egypt. Needless to say, Kadosh Baruch is going to leave no doubt in the minds of both the righteous and the wicked, and therefore one of the conditions that uh, somebody is Mashiach uh, is that uh, everyone agrees. All of the Gdol uh, agree. Like if you ask people today, who do you think is the Gdol Who do you think is the biggest rabbi in the world? You'll have uh, 10, uh, 10 people and you'll have you know multiple choices. You're not going to have everybody universally agree that uh, one rabbi is the biggest rabbi. And that's not just now. That has already been the case for a while. When, when Rav Kanievsky was still with us, not everybody agreed that Rav Kanievsky is Gdol uh, You know, they, Some people thought that some uh, other Chacham was bigger than him. When Rav Ovadia was here, not everybody agreed that Rav Ovadia was the biggest. Some people thought that there are other Rabbis, uh, and so on and so forth. The point being is, is that Akadosh Baruch Hu promises us that when a Mashiach comes, there's not going to be any doubt like that. There's not going to be any multiple opinions. Everyone's going to know who is the Mashiach. Needless to say, if a, a, a Liyawa Navi is going to be the one that introduces him to the world, then needless to say, it's going to be very, very obvious that a Liyawa Navi is a Liyawa Navi. Uh, and that's not going to uh, leave anything to question, meaning he's not going to look like your average Joe is going to be clearly something super uh, supernatural, something uh, that's not uh, a, a costume. Let's just say that. Charlie, how do you know if it's the Yetzara or Hashem not wanting you to get a certain mitzvah when having difficulty uh, uh, time attempting it? Uh, good question. The uh, uh, to know for sure at all times, uh, you have to be, uh, you have to have Ruach HaKodesh. There's a story about the Chafetz Chaim when he wanted to make Aliyah. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, uh, he wanted to go up to, to Teretz Yisrael. He decided, it was a big message, the, the, the Kila took it hard, but he committed to going to Eretz Yisrael. He got on the caravan. Shortly after he got on, the, uh, the wheel broke. So, the, uh, the guy that uh, you know, got off the uh, caravan, fixed the wheel, and they went back on the road. Shortly thereafter, it broke again. Again, he got off, replaced it, they went back on, and shortly thereafter, it broke for the third time. After that third time, the Chafetz Chaim said to the rider, turn around with all of the luggage, with all of the suitcase, with all of everything. In Shamaim, they don't want me to make Aliyah. So, a young man asked his rabbi, how come he didn't say that the first time, the second time, the third time? He says, that's exactly it. Perhaps we could have said that maybe Hashem didn't want him to go after the first one broke. Perhaps we could have speculated that the second or the third. The difference is, regardless of which number we pick, it's pure speculation. What made the Chafetz Chaim the Chafetz Chaim is that he knew that it was the third one. He knew exactly when it's the Yetzirah getting in the way and it's Hashem himself. So one of the main things is that to know for sure at all times, impossible. But there are certain things that are clear, meaning what is the goal? What is the goal that a person is doing? What is he doing? If a person is trying to invest into learning more Torah, uh, publicizing more Torah, surely he should expect that there's going to be distractions, there's going to be things that get in the way, uh, and the greater the, uh, the, the ambition, the more Torah, the bigger the mitzvah, the more uh, uh, there's going to be a, uh, uh, something in the way. And the bigger, I don't mean the bigger like, oh, this is the biggest mitzvah, this is the smallest mitzvah, by bigger I mean the more it influences more people. If it's just influencing you by yourself, there's a certain amount, certain threshold. But if you're going to be influencing the masses, there's a much, much bigger uh, 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 threshold. So it's important to know that the more you, people you're going to impact, the more there's going to be things in your way. In fact, the uh, Zohar Kadosh says that the, uh, the Yetzirah, the Satan, the Malach Amavit, he's considered in essence a king, uh, that Hashem uh, gave him a throne. And uh, he, this king, this uh, Yetzirah, does not get off of his throne 
uh, for your average day-to-day mission because he has a legion. He has a whole legion, an army of, uh, of soldiers that do his will. But he does get off the throne specifically to get in the way of people that are uh, doing kiruv, that are helping people do tshuva, getting closer to Hashem. Uh, that's in essence a, uh, his personal battle. So of course a person needs to know that if he is trying to do kiruv, he's trying to do anything relating to it, he's going to have a lot more problems to deal with than your average person, even if your average person is learning Torah. Uh, but it's, if you're going to you know, help the public, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of uh, obstacles to get through, so get used to it. On the other hand, if it's just an individual mitzvah, a person, let's say, for example, wants to go to shul or uh, wants to, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, go bring challah to his neighbor or something, sure, there may be some threshold, but if you start seeing that uh, it's just a little bit out of the ordinary, you know, to give this person, let's say, to invite this person to your house for Shabbat is, uh, you know, they have food. It's not like you're inviting them because they're poor. You just want to have company. They like you, you like them and uh you you want to invite them but you see that there's a lot of obstacles all of a sudden you got a flat tire all of a sudden you know uh something happened perhaps try next week why it's a number one it's a uh you know it could very something like that shouldn't have that much threshold so don't have that much pressure i should say uh certain things should should be uh with uh, with a lot of pressure certain things not so to know for sure Again, like I said, you have to have Ruach HaKodesh. But uh, the key is to know, uh, not necessarily how difficult it is for you to do it, but rather, what is the outcome? How many people it's going to impact? The more people it's going to impact, the more problem it's going to have in order for you to achieve it, because the merit and the reward for it is greater. So in essence, this is, a, uh, this is what you've got to weigh it on. You have to weigh it on based on how, much, how many people it's going to impact, and thereby how much merit you're going to get if you succeed, or even if you try, it's still uh, uh, trying to do a mitzvah is a success nonetheless. Uh, uh, so the point is, is that if a person tries his best to do a mitzvah and he fails, he still gets the full sachal, he still gets the full reward for it as if he succeeded 100%. But needless to say, if you're going to impact a lot of people, uh, you're, uh, uh, you know, you're going to have a lot more pressure. If it's just impacting you, it's impacting one other person, it's going to be a little less. So if you see an inordinary amount of pressure, uh, obstacles, you could call it, or whatever, or tests, with something that is relatively minor, then it could be a shem, simply doesn't want you to do it. But again, it's a, uh, to know for sure, is not, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're not uh, at that level yet. We haven't uh, given the series about Ruach HaKodesh yet, uh, maybe soon. Uh, next, good evening, uh, dear Rav. The Ramchal in chapter 3 of the Mesilat Yisharim writes about weighing and contemplating on one's deeds and weighs each and every day like great merchants who continuously evaluate all of their business matters in order that they not degenerate. degenerate. Keeping this in mind, what are things we can look for in our day and ideas to have in mind to make sure that this business is not only not deteriorating, but growing more each and every single day. Uh, okay, well, like I said before, a person needs to make sure that what they're doing with their money uh, is uh, the, their end profit. They're investing a portion of it in Torah. Uh, the, uh, you know, to give sale is standard expect you know uh, uh 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 it's 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 expected of you to give at least 10 percent i know nine you know most people don't give 10 percent. most people it would be a surprise if they give one percent but nonetheless to give 10 percent is expected if a person has a lot of emuna and has already been given 10 percent for a while they should try to give 20 percent but for the sake of Torah, for the sake of Kiruv, it's actually no limit. You can give 100%, depending on how much money a person has. But don't give everything you have and make yourself poor. Needless to say, one thing to do is to invest in Torah. Second thing to do is to make sure that you're honest, like I said before. But not just honest with the customer and honest with the government, honest with your employees. Never be late in paying your employees. Never be late in paying your employees. It's a very, very serious mistake. You could literally lose the blessing of the entire business by simply being late uh, with your employees. I can tell you just from my own experience, not to tell you guys that I'm some tzaddik or anything like that, but just to tell you guys that's the, the level of what, where, 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 I'm, where I'm telling you. 
one time I had a, a new person that uh, we hired and uh, this uh, this person uh, initially was working part-time and then uh, uh, there was a certain date that uh, they were supposed to tell me when they were transitioning to uh, to full-time it's just that since you know everybody in my company generally speaking they're all uh, uh, remote uh, you know we don't have a central office yet we haven't gotten the uh, the millions that we need to build the yeshiva in a central office yet so everybody's working remote and generally speaking we're all over the world anyway uh, you know uh, Baruch Hashem today we had a big blessing our uh, our team manager the the the, uh, the, the one that's our oldest uh, and uh, and uh, uh, you know, Baruch Hashem, my partner, my uh, our dear Vimesh, after 17 years, Ishtabach Shimolad, after 17 years of chasing after Hashem and sacrificing every little ounce of his life, living in the place of idolatry of India and everything, after 17 years of chasing after Hashem and literally doing more cube than anybody else in the world without question. Without question, I don't even need to know what anybody else is doing. I can tell you, no one has done more cube than Vimesh in, in the world. In the world. And this person, 17 years, he's chasing after Hashem. Baruch Hashem, today, after Mesirut Nefesh, after crying, after praying, after lawyers, after a million things, Baruch Hashem, but Akadosh Baruch Hu uprooted him from the place of Tuma idolatry, and Baruch Hashem got him out of there. Baruch Hashem, he moved, and he's uh, Baruch Hashem uh, in, in, uh, in Canada today, and soon to be here in Florida. Nonetheless, this is the blessings of Hashem. Sometimes that blessing takes a while because you need to earn mer- marriage because you, you know you're in a bad place. But needless to say, stick with Hashem. N- stick with Hashem. Now, one time I had a uh, you know uh, uh, a different not not Vimesh, uh, a different person that joined our company and uh, you know the queue of organization Bezat Hashem. And this person initially, like I said, was part time and was supposed to transition to at a certain date. Uh, uh, that they were going to notify me that they're going to do full-time. Now, since I don't see the people, I just talk to them, I have no idea if they're working full-time, part-time. If a person is dishonest, they could cheat me all day and I'm paying them a, a full salary. I have no idea. I'm not clocking people in. I'm not testing them, sending them, oh, t- check in, check out. Bottom line is, I teach Torah. You want to cheat and steal from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, be my guest. You're going to go to Gainom. I'm not going to Gainom for you. But one time, this righteous person, really righteous person, they're here, and they, in essence, transitioned to be full-time. They're working full-time hours, but they didn't tell me. They didn't tell me. So I'm, I'm thinking that they're still part-time, so I send the money for part-time. And, uh, but, Mama, I think it was literally a day or two days after I paid the checks. We pay every two weeks. I just had the idea to ask this person, by the way, when are you supposed to start full time? I know it's supposed to be around, you know, this time or next month or next month. When is it? I have five, six hundred messages a day. I don't remember everything. And uh, they tell me, oh, no, actually, I started uh, full time already two weeks ago or a month ago, wherever it was. I said, what? What do you mean? I got so scared. I literally got so scared. I stopped everything, went to the bank, did whatever I had to do to go send them the money right away. And they would tell me, oh, no, Rabbi, it's okay. It's no big deal. I, you know, I, it's my fault. I should have told you. Uh, it's not, I'm like, what do you want me to go to gain? No, you want me to get, do, you want me, do you want me to get punished for not paying, paying you on time? They, <laughs> I know they probably thought I was overreacting. I'm not overreacting. I'm telling you I'm not overreacting. If you understood... How they view things in Shemaim, if you understood, you would literally look forward to being on time with your employees. Never ever shortchange your employees. There are certain people, they not only don't pay on time, but they don't even pay their employees what they're supposed to get. They always find an excuse to take money from them. It's 100% stealing. Guess it. No one is going to succeed in the long run if they're stealing. So that's another thing. The point is, is that there are certain things that ruin the blessing. There are certain things that ruin the blessing. If a person does not observe Shabbat, if a person is promiscuous, immoral, wastes seed, a person is not honest with their money, a person gambles, uh, a person is, uh, doesn't have shlom bayit, he disrespects his wife, she disrespects her husband, a person doesn't, you know, do, does all these things, you're ruining the blessing. There are a lot of things. The whole, I could do a whole shiur just about blessings and curses of, of Panasa. The point being is, don't ruin the blessing. And there are also certain things that give you protection. 
give you protection. Uh, for example, like I said, investing in Torah is one thing. Another thing that a lot of people don't realize is that there is protection from tragedy. The Gemara in Masechet Sukkah in a uh, in, in, in Daf thirty seven B talks about how we uh, we take the lulav lulav on Sukkot lulav on Sukkot you uh, you uh, uh, you shake it. So Gemara says, why do we shake it? It's to protect against dangerous winds and also dangerous dew dew that could be a, a, a flood coming from shemaim or snowstorm or hail point being is anyone that has followed the world in the last uh, couple of decades realizes that natural disasters have become a lot more common a person wants a uh, protection from national uh, disasters should invest in their lulav should invest in their mitzvah of shaking should have literally extraordinary kavana when it comes to sukkot why you'll be protected from those national disasters that uh they destroy uh businesses they destroy lives destroy everything the point being is rabotai is that a person needs to concern himself with doing as many things as possible to earn more merit and even more so to not ruin that merit if you do that surely you're going to succeed being honest with your employees and so on now as far as sales and things of that nature uh you have to always look ahead don't look at the wall that's in front of you look at the wall that's behind it and even more so look at what could potentially be be uh, beyond it don't be uh, uh, uh very uh um uh, narrow-minded that this is your approach you've been doing it for two decades and this is the way you're going to stay people that have that kind of mentality in, in in the world in the torah and everything they don't succeed so you have to also be flexible when it when it's necessary but also stand your ground when it's necessary know that you uh, uh you'll have to adjust over time the longer standing your business is the more you'll have to adjust certain things but also the more you'll have to fight for what you uh what you stand for so there are times to be flexible there are times to adapt uh further try to uh have certain uh wise people wise in uh not just in torah but also wise in business as your advisors uh if you have to pay them some money pay them if you have to uh if you can get it for free the better but needless to say if you have wise people that you consult with then that's a very good thing the problem is that people consult with people but they don't usually listen to them what ends up happening is that people already make up their decision and they look for people to agree with them same thing happens in the world of Torah people ask you a question after they've already made a decision or they ask you a question you give them an answer but they don't listen to you anyway things like that end up being a uh, not only a waste of time but it could be a safek that it's possibly you're stealing people's time by wasting it so if you're going to uh listen to people then ask them if you're not going to listen to them don't ask, don't don't ask them and when i say listen to them meaning no matter what they say you're going to listen if you don't have those types of people then obviously don't ask but the key is to have some wise people another thing is shlomo amelech says and it's mentioned in the gemara diversify into three different things three different things have some uh, uh in your business have some uh, let's say real estate and have some liquidity many times people run their businesses and they're cash poor cash poor businesses typically are not only vulnerable to crashes to to tough times and they could easily be shut down or bought for a uh, very cheap price because they're struggling but cash poor companies typically can't grow because one of the ways to grow is to buy other cash poor companies other people that are struggling other people that have mismanaged their business so always try to have some cash people always want to invest their cash it's not a smart thing you want to invest your cash you want to uh, uh you want to have some uh, some money liquid literally some money doing nothing just sitting there in a bank and doing absolutely nothing and some money is working and some money is in a business third thing is you have to be generous you have to be generous both with clients with employees if you are a stingy person the world will know you to be a stingy person and that in itself p- puts a bad name on you next point have a good eye what is a good eye a good eye is not only what the Mishnah Navot says it's a good thing to to uh, to have a good eye but a good eye is also fulfilling the mitzvah that you love your fellow like you love yourself when other people succeed whether they are your employee your boss your partner your competition that's a fellow Jew they succeed and even if they're not your your neighbor they're not your competition 
when you see other people succeed be happy stop being miserable because other people are eating and other people are succeeding i promise you it's not taking food off of your plate the torah promises no one on earth can ever take what belongs to you if they have it it means it belongs to them it doesn't belong to you so it's important for a person to know that if you have a evil eye the world will have an evil eye looking back at you if you have a generous eye you're improving even if the world doesn't have a generous eye on you akadosh Baruch Hu will have a generous eye on you have a good eye have a good eye be happy for people's success it's a very big world it's big enough for all of us plus more don't worry about other people succeeding and taking money off of your table it's never going to happen you can be happy for other people's success and still be successful even if you are next door even if you're on top of each other both of you could be sitting in the same office and both of you succeeding both of you could be competing and still succeeding never cheat never lie never do the things that the world unfortunately has uh, has made into a standard where you have to practically kill everybody on your way to the top it's simply not necessary it's not necessary to to fight those evil wars if you're going to fight for something fight for something meaningful that's beyond you that's bigger than you that that's morally correct and again you have to make sure that you have a good eye on uh, the people that are working for you because many times what ends up happening is that people have uh certain people work for them and those people grow with the company and those people grow with the company to start making more money more money more money and you know they deserve more money or you know the point is is that it's okay that they're making more but many times what ends up happening is that for whatever reason or another the boss that's making more than everybody else forgets that uh, this person has been with him for 7 10 15 20 25 years and that's why he got to the point where he's making as much as he is so instead of being happy for him he starts becoming jealous wait a minute maybe I'm paying him too much maybe I could do what he does in less maybe this maybe that you should look forward to having a justifiable reason to pay your employee more unfortunately what ends up happening is that sometimes people forget who where they stand so the boss is looking at the employee that's making a lot of money and is very upset because he thinks that maybe uh he's uh, he can get it for cheaper maybe this maybe that and many times he ends up losing something good on the other hand many times the employees instead of looking at their position they look at their superior's position whether it be the boss or be their manager and they start looking oh wait a minute I don't understand he's sitting in the office all day how come he's making the big bucks I'm the one that's doing work here they forget about the fact that yes you're the one that's doing work here and he's the one that's so-called sitting in the office but that wasn't always the case he's the one that took the risk he's the one that didn't sleep for many nights he's the one that risk everything on put everything on the line he's the one that had the idea and so on and so forth you are just an employee you're just a regular person that's the, that's uh many times uh, uh replaceable so and dispensable at, ta- at times so a person needs to know where they stand yes you have to know where they stand never ever be jealous of other people or have evil eye on other people or have any type of question uh, about uh you know about what you're getting if you're happy with what you're getting stick with it you're not happy look for more if you can look for more where you're at great if it's there's no possibility for you to grow then move somewhere else but don't stay where you don't want to be or where you're just there because you don't have a better choice because bottom line is what ends up happening with people that stay at a company and they don't really want to be there but they don't have a better choice they turn into thieves and and this is what happens you work for a company but you don't really want to be there because you think that there are either better opportunities somewhere else or you'll have more fun or success somewhere else or you simply just don't like your job okay and what ends up happening is that you don't end up working what the what the boss is paying for the boss is paying for the owner is paying for the shareholders are paying for your full time instead of your full time you're playing on youtube you're uh, going out for 87 smoke breaks without even smoking a cigarette you're going for an extended lunch you're doing your side project on the job you're doing a bunch of things that the boss is not paying for in essence what ends up happening you end up becoming a thief and ruining the blessing not only the one that you have one that you want so and you end up putting yourself in a position where you are considered a thief and have to be reincarnated come back to the world so again it's if a person 
literally was happy with a share just like just like the Mishnah Navot says who is rich someone that is happy with a share if people were truly happy with their share that means that they would literally be happy for everyone else around them that's succeeding they would never be jealous a single day in their life and they would simply be uh, 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 well aware of opportunities but also well aware of what they need to do in order to achieve those opportunities whether spiritually or otherwise so if a person makes a uh, makes the decisions that I said uh, on on their day-to-day life surely they're going to succeed of course there are other things that a person can do give people opportunities to grow don't limit anyone uh perhaps you know have an open ear if the people are communicating something to him or her that they want something uh don't be closed-minded uh you know with everything there are certain things you have to be closed-minded about there are certain things you have to be open-minded about point is have rules have uh have processes uh have a system uh and last but not least work very hard work very very hard don't uh 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 think that uh success comes cheap uh or success comes easy success does not come cheap and it does not come easy uh it's it just it, the success that comes uh easy is typically temporary the success that comes with uh with difficulty usually has longer staying power so with that being said Bezat Hashem, all of you succeed in all the good things that you do next question uh can i invite guests for shabbat and yom tov even though i know that they will either taking a car service or driving to my house i'm trying to be mekarev them and i know if they will drive and break shabbat anyway they're totally ignorant of Torah. uh i mean have them come before shabbat and stay at your house uh it's you have to tell them listen we keep shabbat and you don't want them to have a bad influence on your house and also you don't want them to sin and either way it's not like uh they they have to drive on shabbat they come you know 10 minutes before shabbat have them come before stay at your house now if they choose to leave on shabbat uh or they choose to leave on yom tov uh and they're completely clueless of torah and mitzvot and so on you could be uh in essence uh, uh close an eye once twice but once they've already know that you're not allowed to drive on shabbat you know and they've come to you already once or twice that's it finish you can't uh, have them come to your house for two years still driving on shabbat like many people do you know once twice you know yeah let's say you want to do it three times fine but uh after that it's already too much uh you know it's a uh there's a there's a there's a line what ends up happening is that people don't say anything don't do anything and in essence make people feel like it's not really a big deal to drive on shabbat or yom tov and uh what ends up happening instead of being mekarev and helping them get closer to hashem they end up becoming the enablers enablers of people's crimes and that's why you see certain communities where they have people literally coming for the community or the rabbi's community dinner on Shabbat with their car for five, six, seven, ten years and don't even feel bad about it. Why? Because simply either nobody ever told them anything about it or they simply made them feel perfectly fine about it. Not only did they didn't say anything about it, but they actually made feel good about it because they made a mitzvah of coming and doing kiddush. No. So you have to tell them, you have to show them, you have to uh, be honest with them uh and you have to encourage them to to keep the law but again to be lenient once or twice and not give them the whole shiur about genom and kafakela on day one that's perfectly fine don't you know be lenient with them once twice fine but after that no more no more you have to they, they have to grow up at some point i saw on facebook the group of women uh of the wall reading from the torah and praying as a group i also heard they have tefillin stand at the kotel for women are women allowed to pray in a group together and read the torah uh tefillin no uh this is a chilul hashem it's a you know, if you'll notice also i don't look at their pictures but i've seen it in the past uh every single one of them is immodest every single one of them is filthy and disgusting as far as their 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 morals are concerned and they're really just looking for attention they're just looking to corrupt the torah and so on uh further it's a uh, the, the mitzvah of uh tefillin many people say yeah but the daughters of rashi they wore tefillin so therefore women are allowed to wear tefillin although technically that's correct the women are allowed to put on tefillin not in our generation Ravadia also writes women that put on tefillin in our generation and especially ones that are doing it in public are uh, are sinning they're not doing a mitzvah furthermore for people that are not aware 
uh, and that's probably the, the vast majority of people, you really should not look forward to putting on your tefillin uh, uh, you know, on a, for an extended period of time unless you are very, very strong spiritually because the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat and many other places says that you're not allowed to think of anything else when you have the tefillin on. You are allowed to think about the, 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 the uh, Hashem, but you have to constantly be conscious that the tefillin is on, on you and you have to have holy thoughts in your head and you're not even allowed to, to, to think about women, including your wife, when you have the tefillin on. So there are some tzaddikim that literally they put on tefillin for a minimum of minimum amount of time. They put it on for only a portion of the blessings, a portion of like the, the prayer in, in Shachrit, and immediately uh, they, uh, they, they take him off after Amidah. Like they, without, they don't wait for the whole thing. And then they put Rabbeinu Tam and so on. Some people think, oh yeah, no, I'll put the fill in, I'll pretend like I'm one of the tzaddikim, walk around the Bet Midrash, go for a cigarette, drink some coffee, have a good time, have a conversation, eat a bagel, chit-chat a little bit, Talk about what are you doing this weekend? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? What that tefillin on? It's complete lunacy. Complete lunacy. The tefillin is a very, very, very holy thing. Don't play with it. So again, some people are clueless and they think that they're being righteous by leaving the tefillin on. Again, if you are able to keep your mind clear of anything that's uh, that's not good, that, and I mean good as far as Torah, if you can keep your mind clear, if you can focus on Torah, you can focus on your prayer, put your tefillin on, no problem. But if you are uh, uh, not capable of doing it, the second you fulfilled your requirement, don't uh, be one of these superheroes that starts walking around the synagogue with your tefillin on thinking that you're religious. So these women, needless to say, they're not thinking about anything good. And everything that they're doing is a sin. It's a chilul Hashem. And they will be punished forever for it. Forever. Not, none of them are going to ever leave Genom. None of them. If they even enter Genom, most likely they'll just never leave Kavakela. But nonetheless, it's a sin of, of the highest extent because many, many rabbis have uh, spoken against them. They're generally, they're, they're, they're reforms, they're heretics, uh, and they're simply desecrating the Torah. It's sad to see that there are some so-called Orthodox rabbis or modern Orthodox rabbis that supposedly support them and some of these heretic rabbis even gave these women smicha, including Mirvis, Imach in, in England, and some other clowns, uh, gave some of these women a smicha, like a woman could be a rabbi, not a rabbinit. So of course, this is against the Torah, this is against the Masoret, stay away from these people, you're not even allowed to be friends with these people. Not even allowed to invite these people to dinner or have a discussion with them. Because the Gemara says that uh, you have to know enough Torah in order to debate an apikos. But an apikos that's a non-Jew, not an apikos that's a Jew. An apikos that's a non-Jew uh, uh, or, or an idol worshiper that's a non-Jew, like a Christian or something like that, wants to uh, uh, put you in a position where you have to debate them. Uh, your life's on the line, no problem. You have to uh, you know, uh, uh, limit desecration of Hashem. No problem, there's permission from the Torah to do it. But if this Apikos is a Jew, there's no permission to debate him. There's no permission to, to discuss anything with him. Not even to, let, to, to stand next to him. So these people surely are, uh, fit the definition of Apikos in every shape, shape, uh, shape or form. Uh, and uh, they're sinning, and those that uh, uh, help them, enable them, support them in any way, shape or form, are sinning uh, even more than they are. Uh, because Gadolam uh, uh, now said it's even greater is the reward or the punishment uh, uh, for a person that enables. Uh, uh, so uh Gadolam uh, al Go, it's even uh, the uh, Mishnah says that someone that causes another person to sin is even worse than a murder. Point being is those people are sinners and uh, spiritual murderers of, of themselves and anyone that uh, is around them. Next, how is a student of a rabbi supposed to act if the rabbi is being disrespected, offended, uh, or even threatened with physical harm in the student's presence? I mean, today there's almost virtually no, uh, no uh, real students, rabbi relationships. Uh, if there was, then those things simply wouldn't last for very long, meaning that um, the... the uh, Chachamim teach that you're supposed to fear your rabbi like you fear God. So if if God start you know uh, it's important to a person, 
and they hear somebody is desecrating God's name, they start cursing God's name, they start doing something, surely that person will do something about it. They're not going to let it be. They're going to do something about it. Uh, quiet that person uh, or, or otherwise. Uh, and needless to say, it's, uh, for, for the rabbi, it doesn't need, it's, it's nothing less. Uh, if the uh, rabbi is uh, being uh, embarrassed, if the rabbi is being a, uh, insulted in their presence or, be, or not even in their presence, surely a real student has to defend the rabbi. Uh, but uh, how many people actually do that? You know, uh, I only know a few. Okay, it says in the Gemara Masechet Eruvin that three things that happen in the world will be timed, served with no gain on poverty, intestinal disease, and an evil wife that nags you. Uh, the nags you part you added, but yeah, I remember that Gemara. Uh, my first wife harassed me nonstop. I'm happy now. I won't get any help in the next world. No, that's <laughs> no. It's an evil wife your whole life. Shemishmo. Uh, and trust me, if you had an evil wife your whole life, you, you would uh, prefer Gehenom. Uh But no, it's an evil wife, for, for not just for a short period of time, number one. And number two, even if somebody has an evil wife, uh, or someone is poor, or someone has intestinal uh, disease, which is very common among tzaddikim, to have stomach problems, by the way, doesn't mean that if you have stomach problems, you're a tzaddik, but many tzaddikim do end up having uh, stomach issues, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to eliminate any type of sin that they ever made, whether small or, or, or otherwise, uh, and, and therefore he gives them their uh, payment, if you will, uh, their cleanup in this world. But nonetheless, this is a, uh, you know, these are not easy uh, things to deal with, whether it be poverty or intestinal disease or evil wife. Number one, it's long term. Uh, and, uh, and furthermore, it's also assuming that the person is righteous everywhere else, meaning they don't desecrate Hashem's name, they, uh, they don't uh, 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 waste time, and they, they learn Torah, uh, they, uh, they give tzedakah, they, uh, they're honest, uh, you know, they, whatever, they keep all the mitzvot. So a person can't say, listen, you know, I was poor, I had a stomach ache, and my wife was, uh, you know, was, was an evil woman, but uh, that's okay that I violate Shabbat, right? Oh, it's okay that I, uh, you know, watch pornography, right? No, no, there's no such thing. A person has to know those things are tools that a Kadosh Baruch Hu uses to wipe out a significant amount of suffering uh, for a person in this world instead of giving them the suffering in the next world. Uh, but that's again, if a person creates more sins, then they're in essence, they are themselves creating more punishment for themselves. The angels that they're creating uh, from those sins will be the ones that, uh, that punish them. And uh, the, the intestinal disease and the poverty and the evil wife is not going to uh, uh, continue uh, destroying the new angels that the guy is uh, creating uh, in perpetuity. Because many times those sins are creating the, uh, the poverty or the uh, other issues. So uh, it's, uh, it's, not so, it's not so simple. Nobody uh, should uh, read any part of the Gemara in uh, the, the, you know, such a simple uh, format that, that it's, you could just go to heaven with a single act or you could just go to Gainom, uh, you know, a, uh, uh for a short sentence or even for or forever for, for single things. It's, it's a lot more developed than that. Uh, Rabbi, you mentioned that men should urinate sitting down uh, to avoid touching the prohibited area. I've seen yeshivot and other religious places have urinals in the bathroom. Uh, yeah, shouldn't all these be removed in the form of lefnevia? No, no, it's not an obligation for a person to sit down uh, while they urinate. It's just a good recommendation. Uh, and anyway, even if a person is uh, urinating standing up, it doesn't mean that they have to, uh, you know, uh, do what most people do, which, you know, they simply uh, uh, go to town on themselves as if, uh, you know, there, there's something missing there. So, uh, you know, they have to uh, be conscious of the fact that the Gemara says that if you are not married, then uh, you're not allowed to touch your breed. So much so that Rabbi Eliezer ben Hokinos in the Gemara Masechet uh, Nida, I think, uh, says that it's, even if he has a, uh, a thorn in his, uh, in his uh, member, he's not allowed to remove it with his own hand. So uh, the point being is, is that it's... Uh, the sages were very adamant about the fact of a person does not touch their breed if they're single. 
if they're married, there is more leniency, much more leniency, but nonetheless, a person should not uh, feel free with themselves whenever they want. They could urinate without uh, touching their member, and needless to say, they could urinate with, uh, even if they need to touch their member, it doesn't need to be skin to skin. It could be you could put a paper towel, toilet paper that's in the bathroom, so it's relatively convenient, and put it on your hand. And when it's necessary to touch uh, and to relieve a certain part of the uh, drops that haven't come out or are stuck or whatever it is, you touch the papers touching the skin rather than uh, uh, than uh, the, the fingers uh, skin is touching the skin. That in itself makes a certain level of separation. That's you know uh, makes the person less comfortable with themselves. Or many times they simply don't need to do it. They just need to be more patient. Uh, they need to be more patient for, for everything to empty out. Uh, or they could just do it in a different way. Instead of uh, uh, pulling, they could just press uh, on the shaft and pull it down. And, and, and that way it's done. The point is, there's a million and a half different ways that a person can protect themselves from themselves if they so choose. I know that I'm probably the only person uh, in the English speaking world that speaks about this in open format these days. It's very sad that that's the case. I know there's some people that have tried to teach this topic to a certain extent now, suddenly after, you know, we've been crying about it for the last seven years, which is good, Bo Hashem. But the point is, is that it's not just, hey, listen, don't look at pornography, you're going to be perfectly righteous. No, you have to understand that there's a whole mechanics to your life and how you operate yourself in order to truly have holiness, in order to truly have Kedusha. Kedusha is not acquired because you read a book. Kedusha is not acquired because you watched a movie about Kedusha. Kedusha is not acquired just because you say Kedusha. Kedusha is acquired with how a person behaves, how they literally think, how the, what they allow into their eyes, what they allow into their mouth, what they allow to come out of their mouth, what they allow their hands to touch, what they allow their hands not to touch, how often they're with their wife, how often they're with their, uh, you know, if they're opposite wise, uh, the, how they perform the intimacy, uh, what's on their mind during that time. Kedusha is hard work. It's not easy. But nonetheless, we're all obligated. Parashat Kedushim. Kedushim to you, Kedushani. You be holy because I am holy. We're all obligated to aspire to, to get to Kedusha. Which means that although it's difficult, although it's, a, it's, it's, it's very difficult for certain people, you can do it because you were programmed and created to succeed in it. Nonetheless, it requires effort. If it's going to help a person to start by, uh, by uh, not touching themselves, by uh, they can't face sitting, they can't do it, they have to stand, then simple. They start with the paper method that I just described. They put paper on their hands, and then that's how they do it. If they could just go to sitting, then go sit. It's much easier, I think. But again, a person needs to know where they stand. Sometimes people, uh, you know, they, they push themselves too much or too little. So a person needs to know where they stand. But again, you have to realize that to achieve Kedusha, it's not, uh, it's not an easy thing. And it's not uh, quick either. It's not quick. Uh, it's, 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 it's something that requires a lot of effort and uh, a lot of thinking uh, and, uh, and strategies. You literally have to create strategies in order for you to remain pure. Uh, there, there are, you know, times that, uh, you know, you have to remove yourself from certain places. There are times that you have to uh, choose to make difficult decisions and don't do certain things that uh, people want you to do. Go to certain events or whatever it is. There's just a lot. It's, it's, a, it's a life. It's a life. Not, it's not, a person does not become holy just because he goes to the bathroom sitting down. So, and again, I know you didn't say that, but that's what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is that this one thing is part of a uh, endless process that a person needs to work on regularly. So if he's at a level where he can sit down at all times, he should, he should. Uh, if he is not, but he can do other things, this shouldn't stop him from doing other things, do the other things. Uh, but as far as to expect everyone to jump on the ship right away, no, it's not possible. There are certain people that just talking about Kedusha makes them feel uncomfortable. Like, they're, they're, they're dumbfounded that you even talk about this stuff. So, again, different people are different things, and, you know, and the world was created and, uh, for regular people. It's not just for Tzadikim. Uh, let's see. One more question, because I have to... 
Uh, let's still do another shoe. Uh, you hire employees who do fantastic work. You help converts to convert. How are you able to so successfully discern between who is evil, fake, and the honest, truthful ones? Uh, very good question. And the answer is, I can't. Uh, I rely 100% on Hashem. And uh, many times I suffer uh, severely from people being fake and evil and garbage and, and, and all that stuff. But I, because I rely on Hashem... I know that, you know, whatever he sends me, that's what I needed to hear. That's what I needed to see. So, yes, there are certain people uh, that uh, take advantage. Uh, and there are certain people that are, uh, you know, bad. And there are certain people that are amazing. Uh, so we've had uh, our share of both. We've had people that we literally <clears throat> sacrificed parts of our lives for them. And all they did is spit me in the face. Uh, I uh, helped them convert, I helped them get married, I helped them financially, I helped them in everything you could possibly imagine, and all they can do today is speak against me and, 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 and curse me out and, uh, and everything you could possibly imagine, and if you ask them, what did I do, they can't answer you. They can't answer you because I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. So, but this is, again, this, 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 this happens. I've had uh, employees where... I don't, generally speaking, the way that I do business and I've always done business is a little, I guess, maybe unique in some way. In some way, I don't negotiate. I know that people like to negotiate and there's all types of videos about be a good negotiator and how to be a good negotiator and the art of negotiating. I don't believe in negotiating. I think that if you want something, you should know, you know, more or less what it's worth and simply pay the person. Now, again, I know that's not the way the world works, but the way I work is... I already have gone through enough transactions, enough business people, enough failures, enough successes, or perhaps such more successes, but nonetheless, that I know already from, from, from my experience that there's almost nobody out there that can deliver what they say they're going to do. Now, the reason why I say almost nobody is because I haven't met everybody in the world, but I have yet to meet a single person that can do what they say they can do. Meaning, you say, oh, listen, we're going to build you this house in the next six months. Never happening. Why? Something's going to happen. Either they, somebody this, some that, uh, intentional, unintentional. Uh, he says, oh, we're going to win this case. Okay, you know, have you ever had a case like this before? No, no, but we're going to win this case. Okay, six months later. Yeah, I'm sorry, we have bad news. We lost the case. What do you mean? But you said we're going to win the case. You charged me $50,000. Yeah, listen, I thought we are going to win the case. I wouldn't take the case and the money from you if I didn't think we are going to win the case. Yeah, right. So the point is that people deliver a lot. People are tend to over deliver so much so that they literally uh, uh, um, set themselves up for failure. So generally speaking, what the reason why I don't negotiate, and again, this may not make sense for most people, is because I don't even care what the price is. I just want you to do what you say you're going to do. I'm looking for people that can actually do what they say they can do. And most people can't. And, and again, I emphasize the most, just simply because there's still more people out there in the world I haven't dealt with. So, but that means that I go through a lot of failures and I have to keep picking myself up and keep going. And Bo Hashem, I have Hashem with me at all times. So it's, a, uh, it's much easier uh, to, 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 uh, to, to have hope when you have Hashem. When I was in the business world, it was very, very difficult because you deal with very big failures and really it's typically your ego or survival skills that are keeping you moving, not necessarily your belief in God. Uh, so, but nonetheless, you end up meeting and dealing with a lot of failures and you have to be willing to fail in order to succeed. And I think that the, it's, it's not really an, the art of success that brings success, but rather the art of failure that brings success, meaning that uh, a person needs to know how to fail gracefully and keep, them, keep themselves in the game. Because every successful story has a whole line of failures that they overcame in order to reach eventual uh, success. And the people that failed and stayed failures usually was a choice rather than an inevitability. So you're going to fail many, many times. I think the art is to uh, try to fail with a, uh, the, the small things and not the big things. 
uh, to take on risks that you can handle the failure. Don't assume success, which is something that I uh, uh, did very often in my career early on. I assumed success a lot, which is uh, part of the reason why when failure hit, it hit really, really hard. Don't assume success. Don't be overly optimistic. Also, don't be pessimistic. Uh, and uh, again, it, it's a pray a lot because uh, people will fail you. Uh, people will abandon you. Uh, it's it's very very easy to uh, to be. Uh, I don't know how to say it. I just uh, already expect people to uh, be almost like a clock of when they're going to turn against you or take advantage of you or steal from you or or, or stab you in the back. Uh, quite frankly, it's 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 almost inevitable that every partnership is going to break. And again, this is no disrespect to anybody that's uh, on our team currently or on your team or on somebody else's team, but it's partnerships in general, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're on a clock. Some of them last longer, some of them last shorter, but generally speaking, they're not forever. They're not forever. Uh, they, and, and a person needs to know that, you know, whatever partnership you have, if you start thinking that this partnership is forever, you're already putting yourself in a very vulnerable position. Because that means that you're not preparing a plan B. You know, I've had, you know, in, in, in probably built, I don't know, five, six dozen websites in my, in my career. And, and again, I'm not in a website business. Uh, I can, in fact, one of the, the biggest pet peeves that I have is building websites. But I had to do it so many times because the people that would build it would either uh, decide that they want to steal instead of instead of do honest business or they quit and got something else or whatever the case is and every time i would have to hire somebody else and that somebody else would never want to work with the existing website they have to start the whole thing all over again and what ended up happening is that i had to pay a lot of money over the years for this website and that website and this and that and eventually i just decided you know what i want to have something that even a idiot like me can still keep uh to a certain extent uh uh on if uh, if all uh, uh, you know if all fails, and uh, as you would have it, I don't know if I, I told you guys a story. There was a couple of people on our team uh, that uh, I don't know, maybe two and a half, three years ago, two years ago, they uh, uh, they just went haywire one day, and uh, they shut down one of our websites, Kiev websites. Uh, I kind of expected something to happen already for for a couple of weeks because they weren't communicating. And one day the inevitable happened. Uh, they shut down the website. Uh, you know, somebody sent me a message. Hey, Rabbi, your, you know, your website's down. And right away I knew exactly what happened. But Baruch Hashem, that uh, safety measure uh, to a certain extent. And of course, Kadosh Baruch Hu protected us that we were able to bring it back online. They deleted everything. Literally, they deleted everything. They, did not, they didn't just shut down the website and just press off. They went and worked on it to delete everything we had. And of course, Baruch Hashem, Kadosh Baruch Hu protected us. But the point being is, is that if you build a business, a relationship of some kind, aside from your marriage, uh, you build it with an expectation that this is forever, you're already making yourself very, very vulnerable. Uh, again, I don't necessarily want people to become, uh, you know, like almost like uh, expecting everything to be bad. You know, you, you have to have some level of optimism in order to succeed, in order to be ambitious, in order to move forward. But... You know, be very skeptical of everything, and uh, but press forward nonetheless. You know, somebody leaving for a better opportunity doesn't make them bad; it makes them normal. It makes them normal. Now, again, if they're leaving you by by stabbing you in the back, then obviously that's bad. But if you're offering a certain opportunity, and that person can get something better somewhere else. And you are not willing to give them that, and they're simply leaving to somewhere else. It's they're not bad; they're being normal, you know. So it's it, that's why a person needs to know that if you have somebody that's good at what they do, uh, expect that they're gonna want more. But you know, it's it's also there's limitations for everything. There's limitations, but nonetheless, uh, failures, people failing you, people stabbing you in the back, uh, people cheating, people stealing. All of that is unfortunately normal. All of that is normal. You have to get yourself up in the morning uh, and, and, and push again and try again and uh, try to do whatever you can to have certain safety measures 
Don't uh, discuss uh, your bank account and your success with people. Uh, you know, it's a, if, if they're on the team, great. But again, everybody should be privy to a limited amount of information. Some people, if, if it has nothing to do with them, there's no reason to discuss it with them. If you have, let's say, for example, somebody in the financial department, then of course, discussing with them the financial status of the company is not a problem. But if you have somebody in, let's say, the, uh, I don't know, let's say the tech support, tech support should not know and does not need to know about your financial condition. Now, you want to make tech support into your friend? By all means, be my guest. It's usually not very good. When the boss becomes friends with the employees, the employees start ruining the company. Uh, because they're your friends and they're allowed to ruin your house and that's a bad thing again it's very hard you have to almost be cold to a certain extent in order to maintain certain relationships which kind of you know it's kind of sucks because some of the people you spend the most amount of time with are the people that work for you so on one end you want to spend more time with them and hang out with them in a different environment because you think alike you have similar ideology and so on but at the same token you become very comfortable you start inviting these people to your house and they start looking at your chandelier and thinking, whoa, how can he afford a $5,000 chandelier? Whoa, how come he has this? And, I, and they start, you know, doing a balance sheet calculation of all of the money that you have. And, and pe because people have an evil eye, you know, people are not happy for each other. People don't, are not happy for other people's success. Uh, you know, they're, they're jealous and, and, and conniving. So that's a sad thing. You know, people many times, uh, you know, it's a, they come to your house and they start evaluating everything you have in your house. It's the most bizarre thing in the world. I don't know why, but it's very common for people to come and start analyzing how much everything costs in people's houses. Oh, you see his house? You know that house? The house next door? Oh, it sold for three million. Why do you care? You live there? No. So when did you have time to go look up the, the house that he lives in? Oh, no, you know, I'm just checking. I just check. Are you in the real estate business? No, I'm a plumber. So why are you checking the value of his house? Jealous, evil eye, and, and so on. So again average person that's how they are they have an evil eye they're jealous they're not happy for other people so if you are surrounded by people like that don't think that they're abnormal they are normal they are normal don't be like them but they're normal if you happen to have some decent people that have Torah mitzvot in their life and so on and also good midot and typically they'll have less of these bad traits not necessarily zero but less but expect that even they will have an evil inclination and even they will at times stab you in the back unintentionally intentionally accidentally on purpose purposely accidental you know it happens it happens people have uh, a yetzara people have a uh, you know a delusional mindset people think that they're worth a lot more than what they are everybody thinks they're indispensable oh you know what i did i built this company i did this i did that okay now you're fired and we got somebody to do the same job for half the salary what how could you do it to me i'm not doing it to you i'm trying to preserve the company oh no huh yeah that happens in the world now again if you are a good boss and you're a good owner and so on you're going to try to help people grow with you but if you see that somebody's tenure has reached its peak and it doesn't pay to continue uh paying them this amount of money then again you have to make certain hard decisions you have to be cold uh, to a certain extent uh, and uh, but if you don't have to be then don't be but to be too warm is one of the mistakes that i've made in my life i've been very very warm and accommodating to people and i've given them uh, a lot more than what they deserve and uh you know and i've gotten Baruch Hashem, the short uh, end of the uh, uh of the stick many many times in my life and uh, if it wasn't for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, you probably would have jumped off of a bridge, not only because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but also HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent me my very, very dear, righteous wife uh, that uh, always uh, kept me going. She's, she's the, uh, you know, she's the, she's the one that uh, keeps me going when, uh, you know, when I can't. But you're going to have, you're going to have uh, issues, you're going to have problems, you're going to have different things, and it's, it's, the road to success is full of that you just have to keep pushing that's that's honestly i i mean uh, i i always uh um uh, enjoyed hearing uh, other people's successes but uh, my my question was never uh how they made a zillion dollars and how they did that my question is always how they build the infrastructure that's my question that i have how did this 25 30 year old kid 
you know, I don't care how he made this, this, this software or this product. That doesn't really make much of a difference to me. My, you know, cause that's, that's obviously, uh, uh, certain talent. That's not something that uh, you could easily replace. And it's a, uh, uh, the, the, the tough, the things that's useful to you is how they build the infrastructure to scale whatever it is that they're selling to, to be able to reach these markets. How do they get an assistant? You know how hard it is to get an assistant, a normal assistant? Uh, it's, 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 how do they get a normal assistant? How do they get, you know, 50 people to make sales for them? How do they get uh, all of these different things? It's not easy. It's not easy, and it's a. Uh, I know for some people they they have a knack for it, or they they just have the siyata bishmaya. Uh, but nonetheless, these are the things that are really interesting in, in, when it comes to business and building things. It's not really the the you know the eventual success and billions of dollars. That's only you know interesting to people that never made money in, in their life. What's interesting to, to real business people, to entrepreneurs, is the process. How do you do it? Because if you tell me how to do it, I can learn a few things from it and then thereby re- repeat it. But again, all of the entrepreneurs that I've met, which has been literally thousands of people, uh, it's, it's, there are war stories upon war stories upon war stories and it's uh, uh, survival of the fittest for the most part. But again, when you have Torah, uh, that in itself gives you a added uh, edge over uh over uh, uh many others let's just say that okay Rabotai Karim, i am uh going to end it now uh because i have to still keep some energy for my hebrew shiur um for my hebrew shiur that's gonna come up uh, probably in the next couple of hours um Am I going to do a all-night shiur for Shavuot? No, Shavuot is a Yom Tov, so uh, uh, there's no no shiur that night. I mean, I'm as much as I'm going to learn, but on my own, there's no I can't turn on electricity and off electricity and so on on Shavuot. It's like uh, Shabbat. Uh, okay, well, have a to everybody. May everyone have an extraordinary uh, Shabbat, uh, rest of the week. Uh, Rosh Chodesh, that's uh, we just started. Uh, Rosh Chodesh Sivan. An extraordinary Shavuot. The next time we're going to see each other, Bezal Hashem, is going to be in the middle of next week, uh, Tuesday uh, and uh, Wednesday, Bezal Hashem. Uh, so uh, thank you again for learning with me. Kadosh Baruch Hu bless each and every single one of you. A lot of bracha, a lot of atzlacha, uh, a lot of siyat dishmaya. Make sure to study as much as you possibly can, not just daily, but also especially on Shavuot. On Shavuot night, try to study the whole night if you can. Uh, if you can study with the minyan, it's uh, even better, uh, but uh, make sure to, to push yourself a little bit, to study as much as possible, uh, to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and to do good things. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'Amen.